Good evening, this is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. Mr. Mahamsa, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Good evening. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Mahomza. Baltimore County public schools and offices are currently closed to the public in order to maintain the health and safety of our students and staff. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through Microsoft Teams Live. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names while making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion, discussion on an agenda item. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act um, for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. Mm -hmm. Eight, consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. And nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informal summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item, um, I'm sorry, I think I'm missing something here. Okay, I apologize for the delay. Um, the first item on the agenda is the consideration of the February 23rd agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Madam Chairperson, I believe there is one. I um, will turn it over to um, Ms. Joes. Yes, thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, Ms. Scott, I do have an addition to tonight's agenda. I move to add an agenda item, new business contract award, MBU 527-19, broker services to tonight's agenda and be placed after item G, action taken in closed session on the agenda. Thank you for that, Ms. Jones. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Okay. Okay, Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please, for um, Ms. Jose's um, addition to um, the agenda? Oh, excuse me, it looks like there's a question um, from Ms. Causey. So, Madam Chair, I'm just curious what um, what is this uh, contract about was the board given any prior notice of a document related to this? Um, Ms. Scott, if I may answer that. Yes, please. 
Um, after consultation with the board chair, Dr. Williams and Dr. Scriven, this emergency contract is being brought to the full board for discussion and approval. Uh, the contract is required for the Affordable Care Act, the ACA filing that's required by IRS for our employees, and more details will be discussed during the agenda item. This was uh, brought forth after the agenda was published. It was just one uh, contract, and so after speaking with the board chair, we decided to add it to the agenda to not violate OMA. So I don't know if that answers your question. Thank you. So there will be a document attached to board docs that we can review. Um, Ms. Gower, if you could verify that or Mr. Saris. Yes, as soon as the um, is approved to add to the agenda, it will be added. Thank you, Ms. Gover. Thank you. Were there any other questions uh, related to uh, Ms. Jose's um, motion to add to the agenda? OK, um, Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rao? Yes. <clears throat> Ms. Coffey? Yes. Ms. Smith? No. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Han? No. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Tester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor is 10, opposed is 2. Thank you. Um, and Ms. Jones, could you please put that motion in the chat um, so that we could uh, view that properly, please? Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Um, oh, and I didn't mean to move on. Um, uh, Mr. McMillian, you had a point of inquiry? Yes, please. I'd like yes. Mr. Mercedes or somebody to answer my question. I want to discuss the academic athletic eligibility again, but do I make a motion to get that on or can I go under uh, the reopening plan? Be considering we did talk about before, I considered unfinished business. Thank you. Madam Chair, this is Daryl Williams. I think we can put that under the reopening since that was brought up in the reopening plan, if that's okay with Mr. McMillian. Yes, yes, definitely. Thank you. OK, thank you. So uh, does that need to be a motion to add or it's just something that can just be uh, put there? We can. To... We it could be a part of our update to the reopening. OK, great. Thank you for that. Thank you. OK, are there any additional changes um, to tonight's agenda? Madam Chair, this is Ms. Causey. Yes, Ms. Causey. Um, I would like to um, make a motion uh, that this evening board members will receive five minutes to comment on each agenda item. Second, Matt. Okay. Again, Ms. Causey, if you could put that in the um, um, in the chat. Um, and we can speak on, um, we can, any questions in regards to that? Madam Motion. Chair, this is Lily Rowe. Yes, Ms. Rowe. Uh, can we ask the parliamentarian to determine whether this is a rule suspension and the number of votes required to pass the motion? Mr. Bersades? Mr. Yes, Mr. this would be a rule suspension and that would require two thirds, I believe. Wait, let me double check. Okay. Yes, two thirds. Okay, so it required two thirds. Okay, yes, Ms. Causey would like to speak to her motion. Please go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, tonight we're addressing uh, two very vital and, and um, tremendous issues, the $1.8 billion operating budget as well as reopening, um, which we are in the midst of. So I just think it would be prudent to uh, allow the time that's needed to address these fully. Thank you. Thank you for that. Any additional discussion? 
Okay, um, I would just like, to, oh, looks like we have a question from Josh Mahumsa. Yes, Josh. Yeah, not a question, comment. Um, although uh, I would welcome discussion, uh, a discussion on what is the appropriate amount of time board members should be having. I just, I, mean, I, I just feel some type of way of us changing um, the rules in the beginning of the board meeting. I think there should be a conversation for some type of administrative function where we can revisit um, the minutes each board member is given, but I don't think we should be changing them right now when board members have already prepared with the two minutes, knowing the two minutes. So thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Mahomza. Any additional questions? Because we do have a, a lot to get to, and um, I want to make sure that we stay on time. Um, because of that, given that I would not be in favor of suspending the rules, I think that it should remain at two minutes. I think that um, members should be able to speak in a succinct, clear, direct manner and um, and say what needs to be said and express themselves in two minutes. Um, there's 12 members, and if everyone um, uh, speaks on and on, then we aren't as productive as we can be. So I think that it's imperative that we stick to our time limit. We're clear, we're concise, we're direct, and that we have a well-functioning and organized meeting. Are there any additional questions or anything else before we take the vote? Okay, so Ms. Causey has made a motion to move that board members have five minutes to address each agenda item instead of two. And it was seconded, I believe, by Ms. Mack. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, thank you, Ms. Gover. Um, may we take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rao? No. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Joe? No. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? No. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pester? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hecker? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is five, opposed is seven. Okay. All right, thank you for that. So the, um, so the agenda stands as changed. And um, now in accordance with board policy 8314, a majority vote of the board is required to add or remove an item from the agenda. Um, so the revised agenda is approved. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. Eight, consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation. And nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. Um, the minutes of the closed session and formal summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. And now, We'll go on here. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters, and for that, I call on Ms. Lowry. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters. Retirements, resignations, recognition of service, deceased. Thank you, Ms. Lowry. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D3? So moved, Mac. Do I have a second? Second, second. past your. Thank you. Any discussion? Hearing none, may I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Mm -hmm. Ms. Causey? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. 
Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Q? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favors 11, abstention 1. Thank you. Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. The next item is public comment. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow up by his staff. The board is currently accepting written public comments. The board discourages comment on specific student or employee matters, comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County and inappropriate personal remarks. A school system is committed to accessible a communication with its stakeholders. Comments from stakeholder groups and other members of the public may be emailed to boe at mybcps.info. The board reserves the right to disseminate public comments through board docs as long as one submitters specifically request their comments be published as part of the public record. Two, the comments adhere to the board's stated guidelines. Three, the comments include the name of the submitter and four, the comments have been received before 11.59 p.m. on the Monday before the board meeting. Um, yes, Ms. Causey, it looks like you had a question. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening. Um, I had a question. When is the board going to be able to return to have um, comment in the meeting where we have our stakeholders have the opportunity to um, provide comment in the meeting um, and also the uh, 10 public speakers that we typically have. I believe that's something that the system um, will be speaking to later um, in the agenda. Dr. Williams, correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. Um... Uh, Ms. Scott, uh, Chairwoman Scott, will provide a quick update. A part of the agenda is recommendation for in-person board meetings, and so we'll provide some insights at that time. Thank you. Great. Okay. Thank you very thank much you. for that. And thank you, Ms. Causey. Yes, thank you. All right. So it looks like the next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session, and for that, I call <laughs> Ms. Mercedes. Good afternoon, Ms. Scott. As you know, earlier this evening, the board met in closed session in its quasi-judicial capacity to hear a confidential student matter in appeal number HE21-07. Now would be an appropriate time for the board to vote to approve the action taken in closed session. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session and authorize Ms. Gover to sign the order on behalf of the board? So moved, Matt. Is there a second? I'll second. Second, second row. <laughs> Heard a couple seconds there. Any discussion? Okay, Ms. Govert, may I have a roll call vote, please? Can you confirm the second, please? Yes, please. Um, who was the first second? I might have been Rod McMillian. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Coffey? I abstained on that. Thank you. Ms. Mick? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mohamza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Abstain. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor is 10, abstention is 2. Thank you. The motion carries. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the reopening of schools, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. Ms. Scott? Oh, yes. Excuse me, um, we added new business contract award that would go first. Oh, okay. Let me recycle. And that information has been uploaded to board doc. Okay, thank you. I just gotta recycle here so that I can get that. 
Okay. Okay, yes. So it looks like the next um, item G is the uh, new business contract award. Mr. Saris. Uh, yes, this is George Saris, and we have contract modification of an existing contract MBU 527-19 for broker services. <clears throat> this contract modification will provide for an expansion of broker services to include preparation of federal reporting required by the Affordable Care Act. Approval is requested to increase contract spending by $85,000 with one awarded vendor approved by the board in August 2019. Okay. Thank you for that, Mr. Sears. Um, are there any questions regarding this contract? Ms. Scott, okay. I have a quick question. Uh, yes, I'm sorry, who was that? Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones, yes, please go ahead, Ms. Jones. Ms. Sears, this contract is required for your ACA filing. This is something that BCPS could have done but because of all the resources like you mentioned, being diverted towards uh, W-2s. This is something um, you need help with, and there is a time limit for this, right? It's a time-sensitive contract. That's correct. We would normally be doing this ourselves, uh, but given that we are still working on the uh, recovery and restoration of our ERP system, and uh, in the immediate present, uh, we're still finalizing all of our work on W-2s, which probably will continue through this weekend. And so, um, because that project has taken all of our resources, we have proposed, we solicited a proposal from an existing vendor uh, to uh, process, to both file uh, the reports required uh, with the IRS as well as issuing the individual employee notifications, uh, the 1095 forms uh, verifying that uh, the employees have been provided health care as required by uh, the Affordable Care Act. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Saris. So this is required for all of BCPS employees for their um, IRS tax filing. Yes. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Looks like we have a question from Mr. Kuhn. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, uh, Mr. Saris, I, I was just going to ask, what does this, um, what does this, bro this broker or this, this uh, service provider normally do every year? Uh, so this uh, provider brokers the life insurance policy uh, that the board provides for every employee, as well as the uh, various uh, life insurance, additional option uh, life insurance policies for both employees and retirees. Um, they uh, they also have worked uh, they work directly with Baltimore County government on uh, brokering and uh, assisting in the management of the health care program for county government, which of course is the same health care program that BCPS employees uh, access. And so for that reason in particular, they have a lot of expertise uh, in the healthcare field. And in this case, with the associated filings uh, under affordable care, and uh, that made them uh, well positioned to help us in this unusual circumstance. Okay, and the expectation based on the description that I'm seeing here is that um, 
they will produce the 1095 IRS form 1095 with all the information for each for each employee. And is this saying that this will be completed by April 1st? Yes, the the typical deadline for this is March 1st. Um, and we have uh, applied for an extension for filing the W-2s as we've inform the board and the public and uh, that extension if granted would uh, also move this deadline from March 1 to April 1. Okay and is this going to be mailed or is it going to be available online or both to our employees? Uh, we have always mailed these uh, directly to employees. Um, I doubt that it will be online because I don't believe we've fully recovered the features of the employee self service uh, system, but I, I not sure of that. OK, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Coon. Next we have Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, Mr. Saris. So um, is this contract being brought to us uh, because although we have a contract, this is a modification of that contract? Correct. It modifies both the scope and the amount of the contract um, because although we have an informal relationship with this company, in our work with county government on coordinating health care, our only official relationship is for the life insurance brokerage. And so we are asking to amend the, the contract by the amount, 85,000 as well as to include uh, the ACA reporting and 1095 statements uh, under this amended scope of work and contract. Okay, thank you. And I know that that was, uh, a finding in the um, legislative audit. So I appreciate the the work in uh, the corrective action that's being taken. I did just have one other question because it was recommended that we um, amend policies and procedures to establish specific criteria for contract modifications. And I wondered if um, your office was contributing to uh, to that in order to have a more formal process. Yes, we are. Um, Mod, we've modified our procedures uh, accordingly, and uh, this is an example of that uh, effort. Thank you. And the final question is, if it's related to the ransomware attack, is this uh, can this additional spending uh, be submitted for um, reimbursement from cyber insurance? Uh, yes, we will uh, add this to the regular report that we make to the board uh, on the total costs of ransomware and <clears throat> we will, uh, the costs, the, the remaining costs that were not provided by Beasley approved vendors will be paid by BCPS and then we'll submit those for consideration for the remaining uh, portion of our policy coverage. Thank you, and I appreciate all the extra effort because this um, ransomware attack was um, just really catastrophic as the superintendent has said. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Ms. Causey. Next we have um, Ms. Mack. Yes, um, good evening, Mr. Saris. Mr. Saris, the board has received numerous emails from employees who have not been able to access their health benefits, although the payments for those benefits are coming out of their paycheck. Will those issues be resolved before this broker can begin to produce the 1095s required by the Affordable Care Act? What will they be certifying that the employee has in, that the employee is paying for insurance, that the employee is accessing insurance, 
that the employee has signed up for insurance? What would they be certifying? So the, the critical component here is that uh, under the Affordable Care Act, <clears throat> employers of our size must provide uh, or must offer uh, health insurance to 95% of employees uh, or be penalized. And so what we're doing here is twofold. We are filing uh, the certification with the IRS to indicate that we we meet that 95% threshold or exceed it. And, and then we provide separate notices to employees <clears throat> uh, by which we are telling them that these benefits were provided and this gives the employees uh, an option, well, advice so that if, if they wish to contest that, if they say, you know, I'm not being provided coverage and BCPS is not following federal laws, then they provide an independent uh, sounding board for our filing uh, as well, you know, as information for their own individual tax filings in which they're required to indicate whether they're, you know, provided coverage because otherwise, you know, there are uh, other deductions uh, for which they can be re uh, claim if they're paying these themselves rather than through an employer provided plan. So there are lots of issues here, none of which really relate to your other question about accessing benefits. And um, this will not uh, aid or improve employee access to providers. I don't, uh, that is, I am not aware of any employees who have not been able to access their coverage. Uh, and I think that that will be an issue to raise separately with human resources who manages the healthcare plan details. Okay, and my second question, Mr. Um, Saris, is what is the emergency nature of this? Why did this not go through the regular building and contracts um, process to be discussed there and then brought to the board as part of a package of contracts? Because of the uh, federal deadlines that we've discussed um, early this month, uh, as we work through our uh, work plan to issue the W-2s, uh, it became apparent that we would not be able to simultaneously meet that requirement while uh, as well as the Affordable Care Act requirement. So we uh, decided to seek the help of an appropriate uh, consultant and wanted to get them working as soon as possible because of the uh, the April 1 deadline. And my last question is a piggyback on Mr. Kuhn's. Um, I, I don't know if everybody is experiencing mail delays, but we get mail very intermittently. Are we sure that by um, trying to meet an April 1st deadline that we would even be able to provide employees with enough time to file their taxes by April 15th? Um, we, uh, we believe so. We obviously have never uh, outsourced this um, service, uh, but I believe that the because we wanted to establish an a uh, a long-term deadline which we hope to uh, improve upon we, we selected this date um, but yes the answer is um, we believe that everybody will be able to file their returns in a timely manner thank you Thank you, Ms. Mack.
It looks like next we have uh, Mr. McMillian. Yeah, Mr. George, just, just a couple quick questions. I'm trying to understand the W-2 process. So traditionally, the W-2s, we received the W-2s by in the employees in their hands by January 29th. Is that correct? Uh, they have to be mailed by the end of January. Okay. And the, okay. And so then we, after that, yeah. I'm sorry for interrupting you. Yeah. So then we extended to the March 1st, correct? Correct. Now we've extended it to April 1st, correct? Uh, no, the W-2, we're still uh, planning to issue W-2s by March 2nd, but um, the affordable care deadline is always 30 days after the W-2 deadline. And so we've been told that uh, if our um, request for an extension on filing W-2s is granted, that an additional extension would be included for the Affordable Care Act filing. So we are meeting the, the March 2nd deadline for W-2s and, and then the next deadline would be the April 1st deadline for 1095s. So They're you don't see, I'm sorry. Yeah, two separate items and two separate deadlines. Okay, so you don't see an issue with the employees getting their W-2s by the March 2nd deadline? No, we we met today, we meet every day, and we believe uh, that we are going to accomplish that goal. Outstanding. And I'd just like to point out, like Ms. Mack said about the mail service, it's it's really, really slow over in my area. And I know some, end, some employees that were to get their checks, their hand cut checks, or not hand cut checks, but their checks, and they waited several weeks in, into almost like three weeks to get those checks. So thank you very much. We're very concerned about the mail delivery. We've encouraged everybody to sign up for direct deposit, which has served us well during this crisis. And unfortunately, we deal with employees every day who are seriously inconvenienced by the failure of the postal service. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. McMillian. Um, were there any other questions in regards to um, um, to the item being added? OK, so then I'd like to know, do I have a motion to approve item G MBU-527-19 broker services? So moved past your. Do I have a second? Second. Oh. Go ahead. I think it was seconded by Mr. Offerman. <laughs> okay, um, Ms. Gover, may we take a roll call, roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Covey? Ms. Covey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Hume? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Favor is 12. Thank you. OK, um, so the next item on the agenda is the reopening of schools. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams. So good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chair Hen, and members of the board this evening. The design team will provide a brief update on reopening, um, focusing on the revised CDC guidelines. And Dr. Scriven will be able to provide um, an update at the end of the presentation about another topic. So with that, I would like to turn it over to our design team, starting with Dr. Zarchin, I believe. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Good evening. As you have heard on February 12th, the CDC issued the operational strategy for K-12 schools through phased mitigation. That document includes metrics, now called indicators and thresholds uh, that we follow. As you can see, 
Uh, the first indicator is total new cases per 100,000 persons in the past seven days. Uh, that is for Baltimore County. Uh, the two there is a reminder uh, that if there are two indicators that are different levels, the higher level is always selected for the level of transmission. Uh, the second indicator is the percentage of NATs that are positive during the past seven days. And the NATs is a nucleic amplification test. Uh, that's a, a new test that we are using now, or the county is using and state. Uh, next slide, please. Actually, uh, Mr. Corns, if you could go back, I wanna provide an update. So as of last night, uh, last week we were in the high transmission area. We have dropped, uh, this is good news, to the substantial transmission with 95 new cases per 100,000 residents. Uh, the percentage of NATs that are positive during the past seven days is 4.19. So again, if you look, that's in the low transmission area, but again, you always take the higher of the two to determine which level of transmission. So we are in the orange level right now. Thank you, Mr. Corns. Could you go to the next slide, please? The absence of in-person educational options may disadvantage children from low resource communities. This may include large representation of students of color, English language learners, and students with disabilities. K-12 schools should be the last settings to close after all other mitigation measures in the community have been employed and the first to reopen when they are safe to do so. Schools should be prioritized for reopening and remaining open for in-person instruction over non-essential businesses and activities. Next slide, please. Lower susceptibility and incidence among younger children compared to teenagers suggest that young students, for example, in elementary schools, are likely to have less risk in in-school transmission due to in-person learning than older students in middle and high schools. The CDC stresses that we prioritize in-person learning over extracurricular activities, including sports and school events to minimize the risk of transmission in schools and to protect in-person learning. Next slide, please. As we have planned our reopening and outlined in the CDC guidelines, we will continue to follow the five mitigation strategies to provide safe in-person learning. We've seen these time and time again, but the five mitigation strategies have been and will continue to be use of face coverings, social distancing, hand hygiene and respiratory etiquette, cleaning and disinfecting, and contact tracing in collaboration with the local health department. Next slide, please. At this time, I would like to welcome Dr. Boswell McComas. So good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity, Dr. Zarchin. Um, so I'm going to share with you the new CDC guidelines as they relate to athletics specifically. And as you can see on the screen, the CDC recommends that when the community transmission uh, is in the high red zone, as Dr. Zarchin explained, that athletics and extracurricular activities should be conducted virtually with sub substantial transmission or the orange zone, as Dr. Uh, Zarchin just updated us, that that's where we are currently. Athletics and extracurricular activities are recommended to occur only if they can be held outdoors with physical distancing of six feet or more. Um, as you know, we have a return to play committee and they have reviewed the spectator configurations and determined that not enough staff would be available to monitor uh, events. And the committee continues to recommend that we do not have spectators at this point. So I will be followed by uh, Ms. Byers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McComas, and good evening. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. So the BCPS reopening plan included two weeks of modified student schedules. Um, originally, it was the weeks of February 22nd and the week of March 8th. Um, 
due to the motion that was passed on February 9th, 2021, um, elementary and secondary schools will now have three weeks when students' schedules will need to be modified. And so we wanted to provide an update on that. Um, this week, our elementary schools modified student schedules. So there would be time in the building for teachers to plan and prepare for our students to return on March 1st. Our staff did come back yesterday and it was exciting to have them back in our buildings. They got right to the work of preparing their classrooms for students return. Um, this week, they will also be participating in professional learning with their school nurse regarding the implementation of those mitiga mitigation strategies that Dr. Zarchin referenced. Um, the week of March 8th will be modified in order to prepare for our students who will be returning in phase three. Uh, that impacts students in grades um, three, sorry, that impacts students grades three through 12. Um, the week of March 15th will have a modified student schedule in order to prepare for the return of our students in grade six and nine. And then finally, the week of March 22nd, we'll have a modified student schedule in order to prepare for the return of all other students on April 6th. Specific information for our staff and our families regarding the schedule for those weeks, the weeks of March 8th, 15th, and 22nd, will be forthcoming. And at this time, I believe I am turning it over to Dr. Scriven. So before, Thank you, Ms. Flyers. Uh, before Dr. Go ahead, Dr. Gives, Williams gives his update, I just want to um, share a comment. So thank you, uh, design team members, for presenting uh, this update. Um, and we are closing our presentation and we'll take questions, of course. But I just want to acknowledge um, our students who are working diligently and the pleasure I have in visiting classrooms. Um, particularly today, just to see how our students are adjusting. But also, I want to acknowledge our staff. Um, our staff is needed for our students as we begin to open. Uh, we have recognized that there is anxiety um, about the return of staff and students. Um, in our Human Resources Office, we have a process, and our team members are, are following the guidelines. In addition, we recognize uh, that there is a new normal. Uh, what we have done uh, need to ensure that our staff members are being heard and feel that their questions are being answered. Uh, I have charged uh, human resources under the leadership of Ms. Lowry to uh, get additional personnel to assist with this process. Um, it was just Sunday, uh, Ms. Lowry and Dr. Scriven and I had two sessions just to talk through uh, some of the things that we were seeing. Um, and I'm so appreciative of their time, particularly over the weekend, but I asked them to look at these additional resources. So as we prepare to receive our students, we also need our staff, our teachers, our administrators, our assistants, office staff, transportation, building services, grounds workers, uh, cafeteria workers, the list goes on. And as we uh, process these requests, uh, we need to increase that personal touch. Uh, this also means our supervisors and administrators uh, will be involved and consulted. Every case is different and situations may require a team effort. Um, so we are seeking to be more personal and communicative, um, and this will be our approach as we move forward. Again, understanding there's anxiety, but to really build more personal touch with our staff. Uh, now, Dr. Scriven, would you give an update um, at this time? Yes, sir, and I will be uh, extremely uh, brief. Uh, we have, and when I say we, the Office of Facilities, along with myself, have been uh, meeting uh, consistently with the Office slash Department of uh, Recreation and Parks uh, with respect to uh, onboarding uh, their programs. We are looking at uh, outside usage uh, first. Uh, 
due to the ransomware, we have had to implement a new uh, approval process. Uh, there was some dialogue on Monday uh, where we were trying to set a timeline of when uh, this process would be uh, in full action uh, for implementation. Uh, principals are currently uh, and administrators are currently being trained now uh, on the new approval process. And uh, tentatively, there was an April 5th date that was given with respect to when we felt we would be uh, up and running and all the kinks would be worked out. Uh, we have uh, collaboratively made a decision that uh, because we are now uh, in Orange and uh, there's substantial transmission, but that is a go for outdoor facilities to move forward or outdoor activities to uh, move forward. Effective March 1, uh, elementary fields and also uh, middle school fields will be open to rec and parks there will there will be a communication uh, that will be going out uh, we have another meeting with rec and parks tomorrow afternoon as there's more logistics that we have to work out at the high school level uh, so right now our first phase is uh, figuring out giving access to the outside uh, then we will uh, progressively start looking at a phase and approach for uh, the indoor activities uh, before and after care, daycare, and their uh, 100 plus programs that they offer at over 140 sites. So uh, that, that's my update uh, and we'll continue to keep you updated as we uh, continue the uh, partnership uh, with uh, the Department of uh, Recreation and Parks. So thank you for that. And I'll turn it uh, back over to you, Dr. Williams or Madam Chair. Yeah, so at this time, uh, I would, would like to turn it back over to Chairwoman Scott. Um, so thank you, design team. Um, Chairwoman Scott. Thank you very much for that presentation. It uh, looks like we have some questions. First, it is from Mrs. Cheryl Pastor. Thank Ms. you. Pastor. Yes, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, uh, Ms. Scott and Dr. Williams, I'm just going to be open and say that um, I really wanted to make some comments to um, Knight um, about um, our teachers and bus drivers and custodians and cafeteria folks and our social emotional um, personnel and administrators in our schools. Um, along the lines of making sure that we are respecting them and the work that they do and respecting them um, in terms of what they give our students. So I had actually jotted down some things that I wanted to talk about maybe make into a motion. One of the things is thinking that, and now I'm going to what Dr. Williams just said, so I've amended what I was going to say, and I'd like to make a motion because one of the things that I think had been sorely missing is hearing his voice about his commitment um, in terms of uh, the Human Resource Office, in terms of seeing our cases as separate cases and having that face-to-face -face time, those phone conversations, those virtual conversations, as people send in documentation um, as we return. So, uh, Ms. Scott, if I may, and I've just fiddled with this, wait a minute. Um, I'm going to read it and then I'll fiddle some more and send it out. May I make a motion, please, in light of Dr. Williams' comments? Yes, you may. If you could put it in the chat also, that'd be great. So we can yes, hear I, and see it. Yep, I'm going to do that because it's kind of long. <laughs> I move that the Baltimore County Public School Board support the superintendent's decision to support the Human Resources Office's efforts to review and respond in a personal manner. Any school staff member 
or related staff member, which includes but not limited to teachers, custodians, cafeteria personnel, administrators, and social emotional support personnel who submit a medically documented request for accommodations short or long term by providing additional human capital to that end. Okay, give me a second. All right, that's long. And may I speak to that real quickly? Well, uh, we need a second. Is there a second? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> second. Second, second okay. row. Thank second. you. Um, okay. Yes, please speak to your without, motion. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Without those people, we don't have a school system. And they need to, to hear the voice at the top say just the things that Dr. Williams said. We can say it. Um, other people in the system can say it. But it is, it's, it's just important, it's critical for our staff in our schools, particularly anybody who is connected. Did I leave out bus drivers? I hope not. Anybody who comes in contact with our children to know that they are loved, that they are appreciated, that they are special, and that they will be heard, that we don't do blanket, that case by case means that we are listening to them case by case. So I do appreciate the notion that um, Dr. Williams will do whatever he needs to do, move people around, um, contract or whatever. So our staff feel good about being a part of our family as we embark on reopening. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Pastor. Um, and it looks like uh, Ms. Causey would like to speak to the motion, followed by Ms. Rowe. Oh, Ms. Causey, you said Ms. Rowe can go before you. Okay. Um, Ms. Rowe, are you ready? Yes, I would. I just wanted to um, speak to the motion that I, I fully support this motion. And I have read through the Tabco MOU. And I see that in Section 5M, it says the parties agree that the board will not issue blanket denials for requested ADA accommodations and will engage in an interactive process with the employee requesting ADA accommodations to ensure the employee's safety and well being. ADA accommodations shall be considered for staff who provide medical documentation supporting the medical condition. Um, places employee at high risk of severe consequences for coronavirus as identified by the CDC. ADA accommodations may include remote work or staggered, staggered work schedules. And this MOU was approved with TABCO between the school system and TABCO. And so I do think that if the superintendent requires additional staff in order to make this happen, that this board absolutely should have support him with whatever he needs to ensure that our employees have the most flexibility they can possibly have. Okay, and I just wanted to ask, because that was a lot. Are, was that a motion, Ms. Rowe? No, I'm supporting Ms. Pasteur's motion because I seconded uh, okay. it, so I wanted to speak to the second. Got it, okay, thank you for that. All right, um, and Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Pasteur, for um, your comments and also for your motion. Um, I also, I just dovetail everything you uh, you said about so many of, of our staff involved in this very important work during these challenging times. My question is, um, could staff address the CDC's flexibility um, for teachers and staff to be provided opportunities to telework and or continue in virtual instruction um, on not having to go through ADA, but, but related to COVID specifically. If staff could speak to their understanding of that and how Ms. Um, Pester's motion uh, would support that. So, Ms. Causey, um, <clears throat> as we shared before, it's case by case. However, th this evening we do have Ms. Lowry 
and her team that should be able to respond um, at this time. So Ms. Lowry and team. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I do have um, three team members with me this evening. Um, they are members of our HR operations staff who work directly with our employees concerning ADA accommodation requests, personal medical issues, and leave requests. And because of the specialty of the nature of, of their work, um, I wanted to be able to include them this evening in the discussion. So I have um, Ms. Bashira James, the Director of Employment Dispute Resolution, Ms. Asada Peterson, Manager of Employee Absence and Risk Management, and Ms. Uh, Kashina Shields, she's the Acting EEO Officer. Um, so we will um, attempt to address the questions and concerns that you have to the best of our abilities this evening. Um, Ms. Kozi, I want to make sure I understand your question and that was what was the ability for or flexibility for employees um, to be able to telework without an accommodation, is that correct? Without an ADA accommodation? With Correct, without an ADA accommodation, but with a COVID related uh, need, whether it's their health, where they're able to do their work remotely without being subject to um, uh, increased risk of transmission. We've also received emails from uh, staff that have said that they, because of their health, they are contraindicated from getting the vaccine that would provide protection. And so therefore they would uh, prefer to find a way to use their talents, their devotion, uh, and not have to take leave and not have to resign. So I'm curious about the flexibility that is in the CDC guidelines from 2012, excuse me, from February 12th. And um, maybe if someone could read that and just uh, clarify what is uh, the position of the administration on that. Uh, and also um, in terms of the schoolhouse leadership, the principals, um, are they included in this interactive process where they may uh, find where they may say, yes, th this staff person can do this remotely and still contribute their talents to the schoolhouse? Um, so I'm just curious more about the specifics of that process. I'm sorry, excuse me, Ms. Calzi, are you speaking to the motion? Because that's what we're voting on that was moved and seconded. So yes, I'm not sure how this applies to the motion. Well, Ms. Pester made a motion about HR working with our staff, and so I'm asking a, a question uh, related okay. to that. We, I want to make sure we finish processing the motion first, and then we can um, ask other questions. So yes, Ms. Lauer, if you could respond as it relates to the motion as presented. Well, I, I believe as it relates to um, Ms. Pasture's motion, if I'm understanding the, the motion correctly, Ms. Pasture is supporting providing additional staff um, in order to be able to have a um, very direct one-on-one -on -one interaction with each individual employee that would then be requesting either um, an ADA accommodation or some level of accommodation due to um, their personal um, health concerns. Am I correct? Okay. okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, members, we need to speak to the motion because we need to process the motion and then we can speak about other things. Um, it looks like the next question related to the motion is coming from Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, Ms. Pasteur or uh, and or Dr. Williams, as I review this motion, it seems to just speak to adding resources to human resources, in essence, kind of um, expanding the staff to meet the requests we believe that are may come from um, employees. Is that correct? Um, yes, I'm going with what Dr. Williams said because the issues that we have um, looked at, Mr. Kuhn, that have come to us are about either the length of time to get a response or the feeling that no one is really 
hearing what their needs are. And so we certainly have to start with staff to be able to assess um, the documentation that teachers um, and other staff members will be sending in. So yes. Okay. I don't I don't necessarily oppose it. I guess uh, Dr. Williams, with the timeline of return literally being upon us with teachers going back to the classrooms and setting things up and getting prepared for children to arrive. Do you even have time to add staff to do this? What what steps would you take to actually do this? So uh, we will find the time. The staff has been working to address uh, questions. Um, we are taking a slightly different approach that sometimes uh, there still may be some additional questions from staff or an application may be incomplete. Um, and so um, we will find the time and in discussions with Ms. Lowry. Um, we need some additional bodies to help with that because I think just uh, requesting some information or requesting accommodations uh, without someone potentially following up um, may be uh, not the approach we want to take. Uh, and again, um, HR, the team that's present, as you heard from uh, Ms. Lowry, Ms. James, Ms. Patterson, and Ms. Shields, uh, have been uh, working diligently. I don't want them to not feel that they have not, but I just think <clears throat> as we are closing the loop with additional uh, requests or information that is incomplete, uh, we just need additional individuals to support our staff. Um, and so I don't know if Ms. Lowry wants to add any specifics regarding what she's seeing in HR as the acting chief of HR. Um, Dr. Williams, what, what I, I, I would share is that, um, you know, these are definitely unprecedented times. And a, as I have, have said before at all of the meetings, we do understand that our staff, um, we, we have people that are scared um, and they're, they're trying to, to figure out what are some viable options for them because they don't feel comfortable returning. And um, the ADA accommodation request, it's very difficult to force everything into that box. And um, what our staff has to do is if the ADA accommodation cannot be applied, then what else is available that could be a better alternative for this employee based upon their needs because we also have to make sure that we are following the guidelines and the outline of the law both federal and at the state level so um i would like to extend the opportunity um for either miss james or miss peterson or miss shields to chime in here to just kind of give you a, a real quick um summary of of what it is that they do because I don't want anyone to have the impression that someone is sitting behind a desk and getting papers in and looking at it and saying stamp it yes or stamp it no because that that is not what is happening and um, I I speak with them um, and see them throughout the week sometimes multiple times throughout, um, throughout the day and um, when they have to turn someone down because they don't qualify for the ADA accommodation, it has been um, gut-wrenching for many of them to deal with this process this year um, because it is, it is personal and it is personal for them as well. So I would just like to extend um, a few minutes to them to interject, to offer some of their thoughts um, based upon what they have heard um, this evening and some of the questions. Ms. James. I'm sorry, Ms. Lowry. Is, is, is this pertinent to the motion that we're working on right now? I, I'm not trying to cut you off. Yeah, because um, we do 
thank you for that, Mr. Coon, because we do need to process the motion. Sure. Ms. Scott, I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Coon. Uh, next, we have Ms. Mack. Yes, um, I don't know if this is to Dr. Williams, to Ms. Lowry, or to Ms. Um, Pasteur, but are the people that we are talking about hiring, are we looking to fill these positions with temporary staff or permanent HR staff? And to Mr. Kuhn's point, if, if we pass this motion tonight, when would we expect these people to be assisting all of the people who are working so hard in HR now? So Ms. Mack, we have um, reached out to a retiree um, to um, get her on board as a temporary employee. We have also um, shifted some staff from um, both our Office of Investigations as well as staffing to um, support the EEO office with the ADA accommodations, as well as um, Ms. Peterson serves as a resource um, for the office since um, that was her role previously and she's now moved over um, as the manager of employee absence and risk management, but she still um, does serve as a resource for them. Um, if we were to hire anyone at this point, we would probably be looking to hire someone um, on a temporary basis um, and it would depend upon um, a variety of factors as far as um, we would probably have to um, find more support staff um, if we were unable to find someone that had the background, knowledge, and experience working with ADA. So just one quick follow-up. These are unprecedented times, as everybody has said, but would you, abs would, would you even need board approval at this point for these temporary positions? No. So whether or not this motion was made you you based on mr i mean on dr williams and your conversation over the weekend you could move forward anyway with um, filling the positions the way they need to be filled to help you get all of these um requests filled we could hire a temporary we um not not a uh, we don't have a, an fte to move towards this but we would be able to hire a contractual person for a period of time yes Okay, thank you for that, Ms. Mack. Next, it looks like we have Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, so my questions are along the lines of Ms. Mack's. Um, I certainly support the spirit and the intent of this motion, but I'm questioning the practicality and what decision the board really needs to make here because um, as Ms. Mack said, this can move forward without our approval and we do vote on personnel items. We vote on um, budget allocation transfers if one is necessary. So my question is what approval is needed from us? Um, this certainly is a feel good motion and I support the spirit and intent, but I'm I'm not understanding why this is necessary. Can I speak to that, Ms. Scott, or shall I do I need to wait? Uh, Ms. Uh, Hen, was that a question directed towards um, Ms. Pastor? Um, it's to Ms. Lowry and, to, and as a follow up to Ms. Mack understand the necessity of this okay but it's my motion, motion. <laughs> but it's my motion. all right yes um if it was to miss lowry if you could respond uh briefly please and, and miss pester you will have the opportunity to respond as well thank you sure miss and i would i would uh, i would imagine um that dr williams may want to ask um if you could reallocate funds then for um these temporary employees. Sure, and the and the board votes for that allocation. So I'm just asking about the practicalities of um, supporting the superintendent's work. We certainly support the superintendent's work. We support um, him and his efforts to provide human resources with whatever they need. Um, but we vote on on those decisions separately. So my concern, and we may need advice from um, council on this is that if we take action, does that preclude individual action from being taken on future decisions? 
should we approve this? It, because Ms. it seems Hathor, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, Ms. Hand. I, 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 I feel like Ms. Pastor should speak to her motion. It seems like she could I would love to hear from Ms. Pastor. However, I was not finished speaking, but. Okay, yes, please go ahead. Please continue. No, I, I'd like to hear from Dr. Williams as well after Ms. Pastor in terms okay, of. Ms. Pastor, please go ahead then and um, address Ms. Hen's issues. Thank you. Um, uh, since I've been on the board, we have voted on uh, in motions things that have truly sort of stepped at the edge of the how. So I can, and I'm often saying we're the what, so I can certainly appreciate um, the sentiment behind um, <clears throat> Ms. Hen's question as well as Ms. Max. Is this necessary? Well, it had not come up. I was, as I said, I was going to bring it up and I appreciate that Dr. Williams brought it up tonight um, because we do get a wide range of emails that go right to this and the feelings of the staff. Um, so it's not a feel good. I don't, I'm, I'm not a warm and fuzzy kind of feel good person. To me, it is about nuts and bolts. Uh, we need to move. If you talk about Mr. Kuhn's um, comment, we need to move expeditiously because we are moving forward. Now, in my mind, I'm pretty much thinking there are enough people on staff that could be uh, just sort of moved around as uh, I think Ms. Lowry uh, pointed to and Dr. Williams, but Ms. Lowry mostly. Um, so I really was not even thinking about encumbering uh, any more financial um, um, in, encumbrance. I'm thinking about moving people to move forward. We do have people in our system who um, have related services, but so we can do just as Mr. Kuhn has said, Ms. Mack has said, we can be expeditious. We don't have time to um, wait. And if it had not come up, and you know, I'm one, I'm fine. I'm the one that always says, I don't like making motions that I think civilized people should be able and professionals should be able to do this without a motion. But we love motions, so I made a motion. And so there it is. But I'm looking at as a long time staffer, having been in my past, the fact that we can move people around to get this done because our staff members who and who deal with our children deserve this. Okay. Thank, Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Madam, um, could we? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, as a follow up, could we get advice from Council regarding my comment regarding whether this action would supersede any decisions that the board is required to vote on in terms of personnel approvals, in terms of budget allocation transfer approvals, things that we are required to vote on? Yes, if council could advise, please, so that we could, because we have other members who haven't spoken yet who have quite a few questions. Mr. Mercedes, are you there? Yes, a vote on this would not affect, uh, would not have any presidential effect for future votes. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So would this have any effect? Okay, I'm sorry, Ms. Hen, you went out. Um, so it looks Sorry. like um, next we have Dr. Hager. Madam Chair, I keep um, being muted for some reason. I'm, I'm not. Oh, sure okay. Yeah, you went out. I didn't. I didn't hear you. Oh, um, my you yes, I was muted. My question, my question is, is then I'm sorry, Miss Hen. We're getting a lot of feedback, but I can't hear you. I'm asking what the practical impact of the of approving this motion would be, given that Dr. Williams can move forward without the board's approval. If he could okay, wait, yeah, that. I heard you that time. <laughs> Go ahead, Dr. Williams. <laughs> Dr. Williams. I'm sorry, um, Ms. Hen, Vice Chair Hen, would you repeat that, please? I didn't know that was directed to me, but go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I was asking um, what approval you need from the board in order to um, provide HR with the resources they need. So if I'm, I understand the spirit of the motion, I support it. I'm questioning what you need from the board because we certainly support you in your work and I'm not understanding why we need a motion to support you in doing your job. Thank you. 
So um, I, I will yield to anything that a legal counsel wants to raise, but I will just simply say that um, based on all the work that we're doing with reopening and the cyber attack, um, as we continue to do the work, we may need additional support, uh, just like there was a contract. So at this point, we were simply providing an update uh, about how to continue this work and do this work slightly different, um, which means we were moving folks around, looking at contracted um, individuals. So tonight was simply an update and, and that's what I provided. But I wanted to make sure that we cover that piece uh, because there were some loose ends um, that, the, that the design team wanted to present tonight. So um, there may be a time in which uh, later on this month or this year, I may have to circle back and we may uh, need to look at some additional personnel matters. But at this point, uh, we are looking at what we have control over. And so simply tonight was just providing an update. That's what my team and I pre presented to the board. And thank you for that update. My, my question was specifically to Ms. Pasteur's motion and understanding um, because we certainly don't want to cross into your lane with regards to staffing. So I wanted to understand the reason why board approval is being sought for providing HR with the resources they need to respond to staff requests for accommodations. If there's anything you'd like to add. OK, it looks like next we have Dr. Hager. Um, I was actually going to ask the same thing of Dr. Williams, um, and, and so he already answered it, but I, I do share the prior board members' concerns about the practicality and whether or not this is necessary, given that Ms. Lowry mentioned that they she's already been shifting staff around and bringing on temporary staff. Um, I just don't want to, uh, you know, s slow down the pace by adding in something new if they're already already trying to build their own capacity to ensure that they meet the needs of the staff. So um, I guess I'm on the fence, but uh, all of my questions have been answered. So thank you. Thank you. And lastly, we have uh, Mr. Offerman who would like to speak to the motion. I'd like to move the question. Second, Ms. Jones. Okay. Madam Chair, I have already typed in the chat that I have an amendment to make. Okay. Um, Mr. Mercedes, how does that work? Because Ms. Causey typed in the chat before the question was moved an amendment. Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Uh, looking at the amendment as typed into the chat, it appears to be more of a, more appropriately a separate motion uh, than an amendment to Ms. Pasteur's motion. Okay. Okay, so Ms. Calsey, are you making a, um, because it, I hadn't stated it yet, so it looks like this is actually a, um, a second, motion. So I uh, will follow the guidance of legal counsel and I'll make a separate motion. Okay, thank you. So the question thank has you. been moved. Um, and so now we can vote on um, moving the question to thank vote. Um, Ms. Gobert, if we could take a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasteur? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you, it was unanimous. Okay, thank you. So now we can vote on uh, the motion. Um, as stated by Ms. Pastor, I will restate it. Uh, Ms. Pastor moves that the BCPS board support the superintendent's decision to support the human resources office's efforts to review and respond in a personal manner any school staff member or related staff member, which includes but not limited to teachers, custodians, cafeteria, personnel, administrators, and social emotional support personnel who submits a medically 
sorry, I lost track, Medic medically documented requests for accommodations short or long term by providing additional human capital to that end. Um, and who was the second on that? Ms. Rowe. Thank you for that, Ms. Rao. Okay, and now if we could, uh, Ms. Gover, if we could do a roll call vote on the motion. Ms. Rao? Yes. <laughs> Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Causey? Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillan? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mohamza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Tester? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. It's unanimous in favor. We take that S off of submits, please. <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you for that. Right. And, um, uh, yes, I do want to get on to our other questions, but Ms. Calsey had a, a motion to make. Ms. Thank Calsey. you, Ms. Scott. Mm -hmm. um, yes, um, <clears throat> I was going to make a motion that accommodations are not limited to those approved by the ADA but aligns with the flexibility addressed in the February 12th, 2021 guidance from CDC for teleworking and virtual instruction, where appropriate, consult with principals who address staffing needs year round and may have creative solutions to meet student needs and staff issues. Okay, is there a second? Second row. Okay. If I Ms. could Kelsey, speak to my speak motion, to Madam mother? Chair. Yes, you may. So it is not clear to me in the uh, MOU or in the <clears throat> presentation um, that there are options and that flexibility is, is being considered and that the ADA standard is not the standard that CDC is using. So I, I wanted clarification from um, staff um, around those issues. Okay, so are you speaking to your motion or are you asking a question of staff? Yes, so I'm speaking to my emotion. I think it's important for um, our teachers and employees to be able to utilize their talents where possible if it can be done remotely, um, rather than them have to um, take leave or resign or retire. Um, okay. And the CDC guidelines are less stringent than the ADA. So my oh, question okay. to staff is, do they have a separate process or they're creating it uh, currently um, so that they're not just relying on ADA. Okay, could staff please answer that? Ms. Lowry. Yes, there is not a separate process through HR that would um, provide that level of um, flexibility to um, for a teacher to work remotely if it is not directly related to a um, medical condition that would be then approved through ADA. Okay, um, so it looks like there's a question in regards to your motion, um, Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, my question will be for the board council. Since this specifically goes into operations and talks about ADA, I want to see the legality of uh, the board voting for something like this. Uh, if I could, we could get his opinion, please. Thank you. Mr. Mercedes, are you there? Yes. It, it's a it's an interesting question, and I'm I'm unclear at the moment whether Ms. Kazi is is making a motion or asking a question of staff, and that staff just re responded to that. Uh, which, which may obviate the need for you know, further discussion on legalities. You know, so based on the response from Ms. Lowry, um, I would ask Ms. Kazi whether that addressed her concerns and whether her motion remains pending as a result. 
Ms. Causey. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes uh, and Madam Chair. Um, no, my my concerns are are not addressed. I'm. It is still unclear um, that there is an avenue that is consistent with the CDC guidelines. So I'm. So one, if staff could. Read so your motion is that still of the guidelines. Um, so it is a it is a motion. I okay. You know, yeah, I that's why I had asked if you were asking a question. Yes, I think it's a motion that you followed up with a question. Okay, certainly. Um, so uh, it looks Ma like Ma um, Madam Chair, if, if I could uh, speak to the, the Ms. Joseph's question a little further, based on Ms. Causey's comment. Yes, please, Mr. Mercedes. It it, it seems that the end result of this motion, if it was uh, approved by the board, would basically be doing away with the ADA uh, accommodation process and providing, uh, it, it appears, a, a, a rule that, for lack of a better word, uh, an employee requesting an, an accommodation would be granted even if it uh, wouldn't meet ADA reasonable accommodation standards. So that, that that's my concern with this. And I would encourage staff to uh, weigh in if they are seeing it the same way. Okay. So I appreciate that uh, reflection and I don't certainly don't want to the board to take action that's not um, legally prudent. But what I have not heard is staff or the superintendent reflect flexibility that is um, in the CDC guidance. Um, I know that uh, our principals work on staffing. They work on it year round. Um, they've had to work on staffing in the continuity of learning very abruptly. They have had to work on staffing uh, with the fall virtual semester. And now they're working on I see this as a segue to them working on staffing for reopening to in person um, and and the CDC guidance and staff can confirm this does not limit flexibility to those meeting the ADA requirement. Okay. So for instance, Howard, I believe it's um, Howard County, the board approved where if there is a uh, staff that's pregnant or nursing that they uh, would uh, be able to have their assignments um, modified or remain teaching or working uh, remotely um, so that they do not have to resign or, um, you know, it's not covered by the ADA. So there are examples of other districts that have um, okay. made specific accommodations related to COVID, uh, but that protected teacher or, teacher or staff's occupation but also we we want our talented folks to be able to contribute and and that's what i'm not hearing that there's any flexibility or that principals who are involved in staffing they may have a solution um but it's not being brought to their attention because it's going directly to hr so i'm just so, trying to work on some well we need to also because we have such a full agenda to get to so I, I really want members to be aware of the time um because we do need to move on and, and i want to make sure that all board members have equal time in speaking and asking their questions. So um, it looks like we had a question from um, Mr. Kuhn. So thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, Ms. Causey, we spoke about this ad nauseum in previous meetings when we talked about the ADA and now trying to modify it with our own directives. So I'm confused as to why this language is being being used to expand the ADA somehow. Um, uh, I can't support it because part of I don't even understand what you're asking for at this point. And I and I truly believe that we've had this discussion previously and, and we need to move move on. So I, I will not be supporting this motion. Thank you. So, Mr. Right. Kuhn, did Thanks you have Mr. Kuhn. Next we have, like a um, question Dr. to me? I'm, I'm sorry, excuse me, uh, Ms. Kelsey. Uh, Dr. Hager is waiting patiently and she okay. has a question. So I want to make sure that we get to everyone. Um, Dr. Hager. 
Um, I agree with Mr. Kuhn that we we have debated this before, and I brought this up last time, but I just clicked through the CDC guidance, and on the list is obesity, which 43% of U.S. adults have obesity. Uh, type 2 diabetes, 10%. Pregnancy is on the list, um, but smoking is also on the list. So this motion would imply that if a teacher is a smoker, then they could potentially not have to return to a classroom as well. So I just think that this is the, the list is very long and it could include a lot of different folks. And I think that the approach that HR is taking on a case by case basis is a good one. I get that the pregnancy issue is much more complicated, um, but I think going with the CDC guidance includes this longer list of diseases that include a lot of Americans. And it really concerns me that it could it could basically lead us to a position where, as we talked about at a previous meeting, we just have a limited number of people available to be in the school building. So because of that, I also will not support this. OK, great. Uh, were there any other questions directed to the actual motion? Yes, Ms. Scott, I was on the list. Ms. Rowe. Oh, OK, I'm sorry. I thought yours was uh, directed to uh, reopening. I apologize. Yes, Ms. Rowe. I have a question for this. So I have a question for Ms. Lowry. Ms. Lowry, in the HR office, if somebody requests some sort of flexibility, in their work assignment. Currently, if they don't have some sort of an HR reason, does the HR office have procedures and the license to be able to offer that kind of flexibility in the same way that another employer might? So for instance, if, an, if a teacher comes to you and says, I don't have any students attending in person in my classroom, and I have a family member with a health condition, can I teach virtually? Does the school system allow the Office of HR and principals the flexibility to make the decision to allow that teacher to attend virtually? Or is, would you need some sort of board approval, as I believe this motion would provide, to give you the flexibility to be able to make those decisions where it might be possible to make those decisions? So Ms. Rowe, the way that I would respond to that is um, no. Currently, our principals are um, not involved in that level of decision making. Um, when someone is um, presenting to us um, the exact case that you just presented, um, it is typically going through um, the EEO office requesting an ADA, ADA accommodation. And again, we are reviewing each of those on a case by case basis to determine whether or not if we can't offer exactly what the employee has requested, is there another accommodation that would be a more appropriate accommodation that could be provided without creating a, an undue hardship at the school level um, that would create a hardship for um, the what they need to do as far as delivery of instruction at the school level. Um, because again, there, there are a number of things that go into what a, a staff member does at the school that is beyond just the direct instruction. And so there has to be a conversation with the supervisor to understand what the assignment is, and we have to then understand what the responsibilities are related to that job for that employee before we can make that decision. You're, you're, you have made the comment earlier about not making blanket decisions, and, and this is one example where you can't just make that blanket decision without engaging in that conversation with the supervisor, whether it be the principal or in an office to really understand the scope of responsibility for that employee related to their job. And um, that, I mean, that's at this point, the best that I could offer to you. Um, I, I, I think again, um, th this is, this is, in, it's HR operations, but it also is delving into, um, ADA with the guidelines that we are required to follow that come from the EEOC. And so, so I'm sorry, Ms. Laurel, let me just, no just add to what you just shared that um, 
you, you just said it. This is the HR operations. Um, we shared that uh, supervisors and principals may be contacted to understand a little bit about the job and, and for that HR office to determine accommodations. <clears throat> but I want to keep in mind that um, as, as we are bringing back small groups of students, we also want to make sure that we have the appropriate staff. Um, and, and just to clarify, you know, staff members are needed. We're, we're reopening or opening schools. And so um, we are working with our partners to say, yes, we, we need more than just the classroom teacher. Uh, we need others in order to run a school. So I would think, um, yes, there's conversations that are happening, um, but also to, to bring back students, we have to have the staff and we're looking at how to reopen a school with the number of students that we have. And I think what Ms. Lowry just said, the operations of HR to look at every case, to look at the circumstances with the documentation, with whatever accommodations can be made, but it has to be funneled through that office. Okay. So, All right, well, thank you for that. I think, oh, Ms. Rowe, you had additional comments? Yeah, yes, we um, definitely so we need to process this motion. I understand. Um, so, Dr. Williams, is it your contention then that even though other boards around the state have made similar motions and passed this, that our school system cannot have the same flexibility with our uh, teachers and staff as other school systems around the state? No, I'm not saying that. And to my understanding that the these other school systems are looking at the ADA accommodations keeping in mind what the CDC is saying, but as Dr. Hager, the list continues on. But I think um, what we're saying is we want to really make sure our staff knows why it was uh, approved, why it wasn't approved, uh, and but looking at what other possibilities are there. That's the work of the HR office and 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 that's what Ms. Lowry described. I think the other other school systems are using like we're supposed to be using the guidelines, the ADA accommodations um, as the guidance um, with the understanding that we do look at the CDC uh, and that's why it becomes case by case and really looking at the specific uh, individual and the, the the workspace that is that is the normal workspace and whatever accommodations can be made. Because in terms of our, our phase in, we are actually looking at small groups of students as indicated by CDC. So um, I, I think Ms. Lowry and talking with her, there may be cases where um, the usual class size would be reduced um, based on those families that opted to, to, to have in-person learning. So it, it's going to be the operations of HR to look at these cases uh, and to work with the staff. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you, Ms. Scott. That's my question. Thank you for that, Ms. Rowe. All right, so I, I think it's now time for us to process um, the motion, Ms. Causey's motion. So Ms. Causey's motion is that accommodations are not limited to those approved by ADA, but aligns with flexibility addressed in February 12, 2021 guidance from CDC for teleworking and virtual instruction where appropriate consult with principals who address staffing needs year year around and may have creative solutions to meet students needs and staff issues. And um, that was seconded by um, who? Ms. Rowe. Ms. Rowe seconded. OK, um, thank you for that, Ms. Rowe. And now um, Ms. Scover, could we take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Jeff? No. Ms. Hen? No. Mr. Mahomsa? I'm going to abstain. Mr. Offerman? Ms. Pasture? Ms. 
Ms. Pasteur? Uh, no, I'm sorry. Thank you. Mr. Hume? No. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is two, the motion fails. Thank you for that, Ms. Gover. All right, and um, moving on, uh, and I want to make sure that we have all the questions um, for reopening. Um, it looks like there was a reopening question that we had from Ms. Rowe, Ms. Mack, and then um, Mr. McMillian. Ms. Rowe? Yes, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I'm not sure who this question goes to. It might be Ms. Lowry, but my question is, if a staff member is denied some sort of alternative working arrangements, either through ADA or any other means, what is the appeal process that they have to go through if they disagree with the decision made by the HR office? Do they appeal to the board or is there some other process? Okay, I'm, I'm going to allow um, Ms. James to respond to that. Ms. James. Good evening. There is no appeal process. However, an employee is always welcome to assert their rights. Um, and again, the FMLA is in place for them. I understand that um, it's most individuals do not want to take leave, but that is another option for them to, again, remain employed um, to utilize time. Um, the sick leave bank is also another alternative, but they are also always welcome to, again, um, file a complaint with the EEOC. If they feel as if we have discriminated against them on the basis of their disability. And again, the ADA is very narrowly construed. So that is the remedy or that is the, um, the avenue um, that someone can um, exercise their rights if they feel as if we um, discriminated against them in our decision making. So are you saying that if a staff member wants alternative, work, alternative working arrangements because of COVID for any reason, ADA or not, that they don't have the right to appeal to this board? I, I can't speak on the rights of, of the appealing to the board. I'm only speaking as far as the legality um, of your question. Um, I think your board attorney would be able to um, answer that for you. I'm only speaking as to the appeal right that they would have if they are denied an ADA accommodation. And Ms. Rowe, they, um, they would be able to appeal. It would go to Ms. Um, Huey that normal pro through that normal process. Um, and essentially it's um, the appeal that they're their filing is, uh, again, to your point, not agreeing with our decision. So um, from Ms. Huey, they would then be able to um, appeal and then that appeal would then go to the board, yes. I, okay, so where is there a place on our website where that appeal process and the documents required to file such an appeal are available to our employees? Because since the ransomware attack, I have not seen our appeal procedures posted anywhere. Okay. Um, let, let me look into that um, and I can remedy that. Um, but I believe that um, the appeal policies are on the site. Okay. All right, it looks like we had a reopening question from Ms. Mack. Um, yes, um, I, this question is for Dr. Williams. Dr. Williams, um, Dr. Karen Salmon announced today that um, the state will require um, two hours and 40 minutes of math test and four hours and 40 minutes of <clears throat> um, ELA testing. Um, I, I Obviously, you didn't make the rule, but how is BCPS given the limited number of hours that students or days that students are even going to be able to be in the classroom with a hybrid schedule? How are we going to accommodate this? Well, Ms. Smack, I'm sorry I missed the announcement from Dr. Salmon today, but it is a board meeting day. So 
I will say it was my understanding, and I'm sure Dr. Wheatley Phillips can add, or Dr. McComas, that um, the uh, assessment that you described does not have to be all in one. Um, so it doesn't have to be in one setting of two hours. The format is still questionable what that would look like, whether it's paper, pencil, um, or electronic or um, digital. And um, I believe this is going to be field testing um, because this is a new assessment. Uh, I will then see if Dr. Wheatley Phillips needs to add anything or clarify something I shared. Dr. Thank Wheatley you so Phillips. Thank you so much and good evening, um, Dr. Williams, as well as Ms. Mack. We actually met with a few teams today to review some of the information um, and putting together um, information internally for us to discuss um, the status of state testing. And so some of that information, because it was recently released, the team did speak to. So our team is putting together a document to really provide um, additional information in terms of what it would look like. We had an extensive conversation today with the academic team and Dr. Boswell's team in terms of what are all of the um, the things that we have to think about and consider as we look at the testing windows that are available. Some of it has been extended. Some of it looks at different scenarios. So we are internally talking with teams about all of the things we have to consider, and we hope to be able to come back and have some additional information as this is a fluid process and it continues to change. We'll have more information for school teams. Thank you. Um, I just have a follow up question to that. Um, do LEAs have the option of appealing this or because it is said today, we have to move forward with the testing. I have not heard from the team that the option of an appeal um, has been offered. I just know that they have talked about um, delinking accountability and assessment and testing only in ELA and math grades three through eight and high school and extending the windows. But in terms of that, we have not explored that. So, and are we so I'm sorry, eliminating Ms. any Ms. testing Matt. that we had planned to do? Ms. Mack, let me just respond to that. Um, that's the state requirement. The state board will have to make a decision if anything is waived or changed. Um, and as Dr. Wheatley Phillip, you know, it's we we have to look at like every other LEA, look at our process and see how best uh, we can meet this need. So um, we'll be happy to follow up. I'm sorry, you were, you were asking another question. Are we, I mean, typically we do like um, measures of academic pro um, progress, map testing. Are we we doing that or are we w not doing that this year, given the time constraints? Given the time constraints, I think we're looking specifically at the MCAP assessments um, because the math assessments, um, we, we do look at not only a fall, but also look at a spring piece. And in light of the fact that we've been in a virtual setting, you have to really think about the needs of children and is this the best setting once they return to, you know, have them sit and be faced with a number of different assessments. So based on the state guidelines, we were looking at those assessments that are required by the state. Well, I fully support that, so thank you. And I have one other question that has nothing to do with testing. Will the board be provided on a ongoing basis of the number of students um, who have chosen each cohort? And can we get that information by advisory area, like the Southwest advisory area, and by grade? So we hear you. Thank you for that request. I believe Dr. Williams can answer in terms of that, but I know the design team looks at a number of different types of data and in terms of how that information could be um, reorganized to meet your requests, um, you know, that's something the design team can certainly take a look at. Yes, thank you, Dr. Wheatley Phillip. We can discuss that with the design team and your team about that data and, and how to look at it. So we'll be happy to have further conversations. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, next, it looks like we have a question from uh, or a comment from Mr. McMillian. Actually, I see Ms. Hager, ha Dr. Hager has a, qu a reopen question. Can we have her take care of that? Oh, yes, yeah, certainly. Go ahead, Dr. Hager. Hi, thank you. Um, I want to um, mention Mr. Scriven, who spoke uh, a while ago when, you, when the presentation was being made, and thank him and the team for clarifying the, um, the efforts that are happening around Reckon Parks. This was something that came up today and I, I heard some rumors 
about um, potentially postponing uh, youth rec and park sports. But I just want to clarify with Mr. Scriven, it sounded like from your comments and your updates that the fields will be available for rec and par parks activities for youth starting on March 1st. Is that correct? Yes, ma'am. That will be for elementary and for middle. We have another meeting uh, tomorrow to talk about high school. Uh, there's a lot more logistics that's tied into high school, so we just have to discuss um, how that's going to work. Uh, but elementary and middle are a go. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that clarity. Um, and then I, I have a question for the team. So I've I've been staring at these CDC metrics um, before and with the, the more recent ones. And I do have to admit, I, I personally got confused with the, the metric that with the number of new cases per 100,000 over a seven day period. And just given that out of the four metrics, the two original metrics and these two newer ones, three out of the four have us in the best or second best category for reopening, lowest risk or lower risk. And then we have this one metric that's putting us way off to the side in the red and now orange areas. Has anyone on this team explored that a little bit further with uh, the city health department or just to kind of understand what's happening there? Because I worry that it's guiding a lot of our decision-making when three out of the four metrics have us looking really good. So I just wanted to know if anyone's followed up with anyone about that. So Dr. Hager, thank you for that. Um, we, we we have those conversations with our COVID-19 task force, which uh, as you well know, Dr. Chen is from the health department. And we're having, you know, that's those are the questions that we're asking. Um, so we are having those conversations. Um, and I want to just turn to Dr. Uh, Zarchin um, because we we keep in contact with Dr. Branch and his team. But I don't know, Dr. Zarchin, anything you want to add? You know, every time we meet, um, Dr. Chen presents the research and the data. Deb Somerville, she presents the research and what we're doing as a system. Um, but I just want to see if, if Dr. Scriven, I'm sorry, Dr. Zarchin wants to add any additional comment at this time. I'm happy to. So we are paying close attention to the CDC metrics. We have not received any guidance from uh, the Department of Health that we should be looking at other indicators as primary indicators. We can look at them as secondary. Um, the good news is it, it continues to drop. So Deb Somerville, who I believe is on the call, she sent an email to me, I think as we were starting the meeting, and the, the numbers have actually dropped a little bit since even last night. Uh, so that's really good news. We're still in the orange zone because of that total new cases per 100,000, um, but that has dropped down to 85 uh, from 95 yesterday. So that's great news. The big piece that we're taking from the CDC guidance is that the focus is on in-person learning. And you know, we've talked about extracurricular activities. We all know they're, they're, they're greatly important to the well-rounded development of our students. However, we that's where a lot of the transmission can take place and we want to be careful and honor you know, what their, their recommendations are. So right now we've moved from what they are were recommending when we were in the red a week ago as virtual. Now we're in you know, outside six foot social distancing, which is great progress. We're pleased with that. And we're gonna continue monitoring the numbers, um, but we don't want the extracurriculars to get in the, the way of in-person learning. So I kind of hate to ask this question because I'm afraid of your answer, but um, how is this going to impact this, the activities that are already happening in schools? Well, at this point, you know, we. I think that's a discussion we probably need to have in this meeting. Um, I know when we talked you know, several, probably a month ago and Dr. Branch was in the meeting, the numbers were much higher. Uh, his recommendation was no athletics and, and the, the vote was to move forward. Um, so I, I want to you know, just bring it to everyone's attention. We are so close you know, to, to being in an area where we can continue and get a little closer to what we knew as normal, um, but we don't want to spike and we, that's our fear right now. We're so close. We just want to follow the guidelines, get kids safely back into class, 
um, and we don't want anything to get in the way of that. OK, um, thank you for that. And um, I just want to um, double check that uh, the written comments and questions of board members about reopening are, in fact, published on board docs for the public to see. Can someone clarify that, either Tracy or Dr. Williams? Anyone? I can clarify that because I'm looking at them. I, I just didn't know if it was my login. Someone asked me recently um, for access to some of the questions. So a lot of, I, I think that just to say out loud, there are a lot of really great questions and answers available for the public um, on that list as well about reopening. So uh, those are my only questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, it looks like there is a question from Mrs. Pastor, and I know uh, Mr. McMillian, um, you were ahead of Mrs. Pastor. That's um, so that's okay. Her and Ms. Causey can go. I see these other questions. I'm okay. I'm patient. <laughs> okay. All right. Go ahead, Ms. Pastor. I love him. I love him. All right. This is very quick. Um, we haven't spoken about vaccinations, and maybe I'm talk speaking to um, the board, but at Monday's May meeting, uh, the question did come up, and as a result, Karen Yoho, who is our current um, president of MAVE sent out questions that one of the counties had. And I found it um, one of the questions very interesting and as well as the answers. And the question was, have we as boards been um, working with our delegates, council people, et cetera? Because what we discovered going, and Mr. Bazemore can attest to this, going around the room is that a number of the counties um, are just doing a fabulous job with the vaccinations. Some of them are small, of course, um, but it opened that door and Baltimore City came in to say they uh, are almost having none, but it certainly opened the door. And so I'm going to speak to and have already started speaking to some um, my council person and delegate to see if collectively we can't make a difference uh, for our teachers, our schools, et cetera. And I'd just like to point that out to the board. And if you'd like to see the questions, I would be more than happy to send them to you because they're very interesting. But maybe that's something we can do as a group. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Pastor. And um, uh, yes, we have quite a few questions, but we have such an agenda to get to. So I, I just want to remind members of the time. Um, Let's see who is next. It looks like we have um, Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I wanted to, um, I appreciate all of the comments that have happened um, and uh, all of the work that's being done by staff and um, staff that's here tonight and the schoolhouse staff and our office of nutrition and transportation, everyone. Uh, we know it's um, another new year starting for our students and I just appreciate that. I did want to dovetail with Dr. Hager and speaking to answers regarding reopening questions. I had brought up um, at the last meeting about cohort D and it was said that it would be responded to but there was not a response. So <clears throat> I'd like to understand board members that have questions in board meetings that are not answered in board meetings. Uh, they should be included in those weekly updates or those um, reopening questions that are published. So, um, I, so Dr. Williams, it, is staff able to discuss cohort D, um, especially given the um, numbers that are really um, becoming so much better in terms of lower transmission rate? No, staff is, um, let me, let me answer your first question. Um, we can circle back because we we did say that questions and the answers um, to the reopening plan uh, would be posted. So we will follow up on that. And there's no cohort D at this time. We're we're looking at students returning next week in our phase in model. Um, but that's all we can say at this time. Okay, and given the um state superintendent's 
guidance to have all students attend in person as much as possible, including up to five days a week and other districts are um, increasing their student days to four days of instruction. What metric numbers or what logistics does uh, Baltimore County Public Schools need to meet in order to consider four days of instruction? So right now we are looking at our plan with a phase in. Um, I, I'm aware of some of the smaller districts or nearby districts that may be increasing uh, the number of days. Uh, they may have had students in before and had to close or not at all. Um, right now we want to we need to proceed with our plan and again as we start to see uh, the metrics looking better for us. Uh, just like anything, um, we will be looking at our plan. Um, but keep in mind, earlier we just had conversations about staff and, and ADA accommodations. And so, again, um, right now we're looking at phase one and phase two and phase three eventually. And as we continue to monitor the metrics, I'm sure we'll be looking at um, some are diff uh, different ways to support our students and it also may mean um, what we may do as I have been talking to staff uh, about <clears throat> once we start bringing back students um, there's some additional support that we we want to provide and looking at long term down the road um, in terms of our summer program. Thank you. The next question I had related to the uh, graduation time frame has that been determined yet? So um, the team is working on the graduation. Again, the, vend the vendors, um, we are at the mercy of our vendors that we've used before, but as soon as we are able to finalize, as we shared before, um, when this topic came up, we should be able to provide some updates to the board and then make some announcement to the public. We are working with our graduation coordinators and principals to look at some feasible options. Um, so we want to look at plan A and plan B. Thank you. And the only thing I would say to that is it seemed that it might have been earlier than usual, but given the lost days for the ransom attack, the latest start that we've had for the school calendar, and just uh, the opportunity for our senior class to be together as as much as they can before they graduate. I would hope that uh, graduations would not be sooner than usual, but in fact would be later than usual. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and um, we have Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I would like to start with some questions about sports. Uh, could somebody please move to the um, the slides that show the discussion around sports and I'd like to like ask uh, Dr. I think is Dr. Zarkin Zarchin, I'm sorry if I'm massacring your name. Um, I'm not clear based on what this says as to whether or not we're going to be having sports. Can can you uh, you know I, I thought I saw it said back to virtual this is the wrong slide by the way um that that our sports would not be in person so i i need clarification of that first please so based on where we are right now and, and we are not on the is this a slide you wanted or did yes you want I'm, all right so i see we're in the orange zone so we yes. are we are going to have sports held outdoors. Correct. OK, so. With that being the case, what sports are we not going to have at this point in time? Based on where we are, the recommendation is outdoors with six feet of social distancing. So anything that could not be done outdoors, the recommendation is it's on hold until we get to the yellow rate of transmission. Okay, can you explain what it would take, what it would take us to get to the yellow? So the yellow right now we're at an 85 
per 100,000 cases. For the yellow, which is moderate transmission, it's between 10 and 49. And that's the higher of the two indicators. The percent of the NATS uh, testing, is, it, we're, we're in a good spot there. We've got to get the total cases per 100,000 down. And it's, it's continued to drop each week. And even in the last day, we've seen a, a, a noticeable drop from 95 to 85. Yes, I believe there's there's been significant drops across the entire country. So, um, you know, I thought that we were in a better position than than what I'm seeing here. So, what I'm hearing is indoor and indoor for fall is um, is that badminton and volleyball that would be restricted. Badminton, no. volleyball, and cheerleading, Mr. Kuhn, are our indoor fall sports. And Mr. Sai, unless I misquoted something, please correct me. No, you're correct. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Mr. Kuhn. I, I have I have a few more questions. I'm sorry. Um, oh. Just just to clarify something, I, I was flipping through the comments and one of the things that I'm looking at talks about phase four uh, which shows 85,000 students returning on April 6th and that in a hybrid situation they'll only have 24 in-person days and seniors will actually only be in class 12 days. Is that accurate Dr. Williams? So phase four, um, there are two parts. Um, there's the grade six and nine um, on, if I have my date, design team. Let me ask the design team to yeah, give the dates. Six, six, and, six right. and nine, six and nine return on March 22nd and um, grades three through five grades seven through eight and grades 10 through 12 return on April 6th. Yes, thank you. Okay. Okay, okay. so just to clarify, we, we have designed this return so that our seniors will literally only have 12 days in the school. I think that's time. I'd like an answer, thank you. And, and my yes, please, if you all could answer Mr. Coon's question, please. So we designed the, the phase in. Um, yes, so I don't know if there's 12 days uh, from April 6 until um, when seniors are done. Um, but as 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 you shared, yes, there is a phase in. Um, and we can provide the number of days. I'm not looking at a calendar to provide that, but we can follow up. Thank you. And I just want to remind members, this is not the only item on the agenda. We have quite a few other items to get to on the agenda, and I want to make sure that we have ample time to discuss those. So um, I just would ask that everyone please keep that in mind um, as, as we go forward. So um, <laughs> um, Mr. McMillian, you had a question or comment others yes if we're done with these others i have a motion i'd like to make okay i move that bcps temporarily modify our current athletic academic eligibility requirements for high school and middle school student athletes to a 1.00 gpa and not more than two e's to expire on june 30th 2021 effective immediately upon msde and MPSSAA approval. Thank you. Second, Causey. Second, Causey. <laughs> okay, Mr. McMillian, could you please put that in the chat? I, it, it, I, I emailed it to everybody, you know, yesterday afternoon, so everybody has it, and I sent it to Mr. Mercedes here a couple minutes ago. But I will type it in, in chat if you want it in chat. Okay, all right. Thank you for emailing it to all of us so that we have that. Okay, would you like to speak to your motion? Yes. I accept full responsibility for writing a general motion two weeks ago that 
contributed to the denial by the state. I accept full responsibility for that. Anybody that knows me, it was not my intention to give students that have done nothing in the classroom a reward of being able to play athletics. That's not what I'm about. Uh, I want to give students uh, hope. The student that is struggling, that's having a difficulty sitting in front of a computer for six hours, that maybe some days doesn't have internet connection, I want to give that individual the opportunity. So a 1.0 would be a straight D average with the allowing two E's would mean that if a student had the two E's, he would must have a two C's to balance that out to get to 1.0. In my new motion, it, it has a time frame to it and it has a standard to it. And I think that that will contribute to it meeting the state requirements. Thank you. OK, thank you for that, Mr. McMillian. I'd like to restate your motion so that um, uh, it can be the property of the assembly. Uh, Mr. McMillian moves that BCPS temporarily modify our current. Um, sorry, it was my chat was moving up. I'll start over again. Mr. McMillian moves that BCPS temporarily modify our current athletic academic eligibility requirements for high school and middle school student athletes. Um, 2.0 GPA and not more than 1E to uh, 1.0 GPA and not more than 2Es to expire on June 30th, 2021, effective me immediately upon MSDE and MPSSA approval. And that was seconded by, I heard two voices. Um, Can let Ms. Causey have it. It was seconded by Ms. Causey. Okay, thank you for that. All right, Mr. McMillian spoke to his motion, and it looks like we have quite a few questions. Uh, Mr. Offerman, um, you motion. have a comment? No, I would. I will. I would like to move the motion. Second. I, sorry, I was in line to make a comment. Okay, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Offerman. Um, you said you want to move the. Could you yeah. repeat that again, please? I. I would like to move the question. OK, and was there a second? Second, Ms. Jose. OK, so the question has been moved and seconded um, to end debate, so we can vote on that. Uh, Ms. Gover, if you could take a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? No. Mr. McMillian? No. Ms. Joseph? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? No. Ms. Scott? Yes. Favor is six. Opposed to six. OK. So that means that debate does not end. So it looked like there was a question um, from going in order. Um, going next down here to comments. Uh, Ms. Causey, it looked like you had a comment and a question. Actually, Ms. Scott, I was before Ms. Causey. Oh, I do apologize. You are right. It was Mr. Offerman. Then it was Ms. Jose. Yes, so it's Ms. Jose, then Ms. Causey. Thank you. I would like to hear from uh, Dr. Williams on this uh, motion as well as from Dr. McCombs, if we could. Thank you. Sure, thank you, Ms. Jones. And I know we have Dr. McComas as well as Michael Sai. So um, <clears throat> I, I believe extracurricular activities are very important. Uh, we have talked about uh, students uh, being well-rounded and they should be a part of any program. Um, however, I, I have to put my superintendent hat on, educators hat on, and dad's hat on. They have three kids that participate in athletics. I think our schoolwork is the priority. Our current standard speaks to a grade point average, uh, equal greater than 2.0, and no more than one failing grade. Um, that is the least we can expect from our student athletes. Um, I, I believe we have to focus on that phrase, student athlete. And I, I disagree with changing our standards. Um, 
last time board members referenced hope. Um, and I think we need to focus on our student athletes who are progressing through towards graduation. And, and my hope is to prepare our students to be college and career ready and to be well rounded students. Um, and so um, my my feeling is that the standard that we have 2.0 or greater and no more than one failing grade is the standard that we want to continue um, for our student athletes and just knowing what students must do and to manage the work of practice and games and school work it has to be that that balance and so uh, then talking to our team about this I, I really have to say we should keep our standard and not change our standard um, for these um, two upcoming seasons um, but Dr. McCombs anything you want to share no, Dr. Williams, I support everything you just said, and I'll yield my speaking opportunity to Mr. Sai as he works most directly with our athletic directors, the return to play committee. Um, so Mr. Sai, if you would like to add any comment, now's your opportunity. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Dr. McComas and um, board. <clears throat> I won't be long. Um, and again, I, I'll piggyback off what Dr. Uh, Williams has stated. Um, we, we, our students have a problem right now and the kids are struggling academically for various reasons as it relates to virtual instruction and COVID. Um, as stated by our student board member, Mr. Mahomes, the last time, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, allowing student athletes to participate in sports is not going to help them when they are currently struggling academically. So in my opinion, we should be discussing what kinds of supports we can put in place to offer our students to address the issues of the, of the failing grades. Because at the end of the day, it's not the sport that's going to fix this current problem. In addition, modifying this rule will only cause additional concerns for the upcoming fall season because academic, academic standards will be lower than what they normally are. Parents will also challenge this uh, as there will be still students excluded from interscholastic sports and many will want to know the justification for a 1.0 and no more than um, two failing grades. I'm not sure what the outcome of this motion will be, but I do realize the importance of athletics. I do realize the impact it has on our kids, and I do realize it saves our kids, but so does education. And while I know that many may not agree with this, as a leader and educator, I must support this. So as I close out, and, and I'll be really quick with this, I wanted to share something with you. Over the past, past five months, Dr. Williams has asked leadership to look at various topics of interest in BCPS, to imp improve the school system and eligibility was one of them. During this journey that is currently still going on that right now, we have looked at data, other school systems, NCAA requirements and other factors. Recently, we wanted to hear from our student athletes to get a perspective regarding eligibility. We interviewed many students randomly selected from BCPS high schools. And I believe that this response by one of our BCPS students sums up the importance of this rule. The question was, do student do eligibility requirements impact how you approach your academic slash schoolwork? This was the response and I quote, yes it does because I always know if I'm doing my best in the classroom, I don't deserve to be on the field because everything starts in the classroom. That's why we're called student athletes. We are students first. So I wanted to share that with you because this is one of our own students in Baltimore County speaking to the importance of the rule and how it supports them academically to reach the goals of um, that they have. So again, in, in closing, uh, I'd like to thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak regarding uh, the eligibility policy. Thank you so much for that, Mr. Sai. Um, it looks like um, I had skipped over and I apologize. Uh, Josh Mahumza. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, no problem. Um, and first and foremost, I, I want to just recognize Mr. McMillian for his passion and advocacy for um, athletics. Uh, and I've talked to him um, a lot, uh, numerous times about how we can um, improve access to, uh, to extracurriculars. And he's been a proponent for, uh, for that. And I, I hold tremendous respect for him. But I, these, this is one of the things that I have to disagree with. And um, I, I really don't think it's beneficial to our students. Um, 
and it, it's not respectful to um, our values as educators and um, leaders in our educational system. But I've already talked about this uh, last meeting. Uh, I guess my question is going to go to council now and even Miss Howie. Um, the board has uh, a policy uh, rule uh, 6702, um, and I'm reading from page three under the academic eligibility uh, high school academic eligibility, which says students are academically ineligible if they have less than a 2.0 grade point average with no more than one failing uh, incomplete or medical grade in the preceding quarter. I guess how is it possible we can wait uh, make a waiver without uh, Actually, let me rephrase. Can we make a waiver if we still have an outstanding uh, policy? Is this appropriate or does the policy allow us to make this waiver? Because I, I didn't see language in the policy that allows us to make such waivers. Well, Mr. Mohammed, Eric Brissett is here. Uh, it, it's the board's policy and the board could through this motion, uh, create an exception to it. OK. Um, and so it's fine without uh, having to create any new language to this? The, the policy doesn't prevent this motion from going forward. OK. Um, OK, thank you for that. And I, that, that was just, uh, only the clarification I uh, needed. Uh, the only thing I have to say is um, athletics are, are one of the programs we provide to students um, to allow them um, to succeed in school, um, uh, to provide positive incentives. Uh, and it's, it's a passion for that many students have. Uh, and a lot of them go on to college, um, but with those who go on to college and continue with their sports, academic is still at the forefront. Um, and I'm just going to cite the GPAs uh, and the. Sorry, I'm out of time. I'm sorry. So that's time. <laughs> Thank you. OK, next we have Ms. Causey. Ms. Causey. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I appreciate all the comments that have been made, and um, I know um, Mr. Sai and his commitment to student athletes. Um, but let's be clear, this is not a regular year. There's nothing about this year that's regular or typical. Uh, people have had waivers for all kinds of things. Um, and it is well documented that exercise actually improves academic achievement. And for our students that are feeling isolated and depressed and not engaged in their schoolwork, engaging in exercise with their peers is going to be in and of itself uh, an improvement for their academics. So this is not just about students engaging in athletics. It's about helping students do the best that they can in a very difficult time. Um, I have a question uh, for, I believe it's Mr. Sai. The motion states effective immediately, but I wanted to see whether we needed to make it retroactive so that students that had already registered but were denied because of their grades. Um, do we need to make this retroactive to February um, 12th? Uh, yeah, I would believe that you would need to if, if those kids that originally came out um, and then were told that they couldn't come out would be then be allowed to come back out. If that makes any sense. So should I make an amendment to make it retroactive to February 12th? Mr. Mercedes? Yes, you would need to make an amendment to include that retroactive language. OK, thank you. Um, I make a motion to amend Mr. McMillian's motion to make it retroactive to February 12th. Is there a second row? Second okay. row. All right, and if you could um, put that again in the chat so that I can restate it. All 
Okay. And um, as Ms. Causey is putting that in the chat, I will restate it and then we will process the amendment to the motion. Ms. Causey, are you putting it in the chat? Oh, yes. there it is. Thank you. So I restate Ms. Causey made an amendment to the motion, or yeah, Ms. Causey made a motion to amend Mr. McMillian's motion retroactive to February 12th, and it was seconded by Ms. Rao. Um, are there any questions on Ms. Causey's amendment? Okay, if not, it's been moved and seconded. Ms. Gilbert, could we vote on Ms. Causey's amendment, please? Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Ms. Jost? Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Yes. Mr. Kim? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. All favor is nine. Okay. Okay, now the vote is on the motion as amended. So, um, again, the motion is um, that um, I'm, I'm going to restate the full motion that BCPS. Ms. Scott, I never got to make my comment. There's actually several other people also. Okay, so before we vote on the motion, then now we need to um, process the comments. I Okay, so our next comment is Ms. Pastor. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. McMillian and I had um, a good time talking about this. And so I, and I too, like Mr. Mahumza said, I know his heart and I know I have a sense of the kind of AD he was. My concern is two E's. I know it does the math and balances out. He has that person has to have two C's, but the students would still have two E's. And I worry about who I heard someone make a comment about this is going to help spur on their academic prowess, but who's going to do that for them? There's nothing that indicates that they have to do a study hall or they have to have a tutor, that they have to pull those grades up while they are working. And so what they have the chance of happening is that they fall into a greater abyss while they are doing that. Now, silly me, because I don't know the athletics programs in this way. I said do intramurals so they can go out and have these opportunities. Mr. McMillian just chuckled nicely, kindly. But again, I'm worried about those academics. And I just made it akin to Antonio Brown, who's a grown man with a lot of talent, who had one waiver too many and had to live with Tom Brady because he thinks for the rest of his life, he will be given waivers and getting a buy in life. And I see nothing that is going to make these children do better. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pastor. Next we have Ms. Mack. Ms. Mack. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Yes, I'm sorry, I could I was muted. Um, I would normally not support a motion that could negatively impact educational outcomes for kids, but and it's a big but. Um, this motion has an end date, which I appreciate. Um, Ms. Causey said it, and I'll reiterate it. This has been an un unprecedented year. And I know firsthand over the last two weeks, I am typically somebody who loves to learn and can usually learn in any setting, but I am going through a certification process that requires 40 hours of online training. And I am barely holding on because I find so many other things that 
I could get involved with instead of paying attention. And I have to wonder if that is not also impacting our students who in another year would have the grades that they need. And I guess my final comment is, what if a student who has never been able to participate in sports in previous years gets the opportunity this year and is so spurred on by the opportunity to be a member of a team that that becomes the impetus for his or her improving academically. And I, 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 that might be a reach, but you know, it could be the exposure that a student needs to understand that he or she needs to keep it all together in order to um, do well academically and be able to play sports. So I do support this motion. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Next we have Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I voted against uh, Mr. McMillian's uh, previous motion about this because we are here to educate our children and academics come first in my mind. Um, I appreciate that Mr. McMillian came back and put, um, uh, you know, some floor on on requirements so that uh, children have to at least be passing because of 1.0, which is a D, is passing. Um, and after feedback uh, from from various people in the community, I'm, I'm realizing that it's more complicated than that. That children that have IEPs and 504s, which have not been met, where we have failed them has put them in a position, an untenable position, where they're challenged to even perform, uh, you know, basic, uh, basically at this point. So I'm going to support this motion. Um, and, you know, <laughs> it's a challenge for me to support it, but I will support it because uh, it is limited to the end of this year and because we're in a pandemic and our kids will actually be able to go to a field, even if they're not allowed in the school, uh, because uh, they have to wait until April 6th. So thank you very much. I'll be supporting this motion. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. And next, it looks like we have Dr. Hager. Yeah, um, first of all, I swear I'm more of an academic person than an athletics person, but I keep speaking to athletics, which is fine because I, I think they're wonderful as well. Um, but I do want to say that the, the connection between sports and academics is not linear it tends to be more cyclical. And so for some kids, they strive to improve their grades so they can play sports. And there are some kids who play sports and that structure that's in place, even outside of whether there are study hall opportunities or other things in place, but having a coach and having a time that you have practice and all those structures can often really support academic success as well. And so for so many reasons, I am supporting this, this motion. But I do appreciate the, the modifications that, that Mr. McMillian made to it, but I do think it would be it would be good for our students. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Dr. Hager. Um, Ms. Rowe? Yes, I support this motion. I support the modifications that Mr. McMillian made. And I support it for all the reasons everyone else has stated, but also for another reason. And we talk about this a lot, and this is our opportunity to do it. And that is to speak to the whole child. When I was in high school, I had a very traumatic childhood, very traumatic childhood. And I lived for one thing, marching band. And if I had had to go through high school living through this pandemic and they took me out of band, I can tell you right now, my grades would have fell into the toilet and nothing short of putting that horn back in my hands would have made my grades come up. And I would hate to see children who did well that keeping them out of a sport is putting them into so much depression they can't perform because we have a high poverty rate in our county and in our school system, and that means a high trauma rate. And so if we're talking about the whole child, then we have to consider the fact that whether we like it or not, some of these kids keep their academics up for the sports or for band or for whatever else is they're doing that gives them life because they're not academics. They're just doing it because. So. I think that we need to not set them up to fail in this respect. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Looks like we have a comment from Ms. Hen. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to offer an amendment to the motion on the floor, if I may. Yes, I think we have one amendment, so 
Yes, we can have, uh, I believe, two amendments. Yes. Thank you. I move to insert following the end of the current motion. I further move that BCPS provide eligibility reports to each high school and middle school of students meeting the requirements. Okay, is there a second? Okay. Um, and I can put that in the second, chat. Second, Causey. Okay, so this is the second amendment. Uh, now, I guess I would. I, I would, if I, may I, I, if I could, I, I'm sorry, excuse me, if I could just ask uh, uh, Mr. Mercedes, this appears to be a second amendment. I, I mean, excuse me, a second motion. Uh, Mr. Mercedes, could you weigh on in on that? Could could Ms. Hen repeat her her proposed amendment? Yes. yes. And and grammatically, it's a new sentence, but I can rewrite it if it needs to be combined. Um, it it states: I further move that BCPS provide reports of all eligible students to high schools and middle schools. Yeah, that sounds like a, uh, the spirit of it sounds like a new motion. Then I can rephrase it because it it is um, adding a, it's adding to the current motion to indicate that a rep an eligibility report be provided to high schools and middle schools to assist athletic directors in implementing the motion. Mr. Mercedes, could you weigh in please? I, I think it's sufficiently germane. It, it's uh, it's reaching the edges of needing to be in a separate motion, uh, but I think it's sufficiently uh, pertinent to the motion to uh, constitute an amendment. I would just point out I'm I'm seeing that uh, Dr. McComas is saying that this is something that, in her view, doesn't need to be a motion. But maybe staff can speak to that. Uh, yes, Dr. McCombs, could you um, please speak to that? You're saying it's in operations? Yeah, yes, thank you. Um, I just wanted to provide clarity and certainly um, Mr. Sai can add to it if, if need be. Um, the fact that we have an eligibility standard requires us to uh, analyze and look at the students who meet that criteria. So it is an inferred task within the motion. So for it to be a stand aside motion is is really redundant because in order for us to to identify who are the students that meet the criteria, we have to be able to identify students and, lo and look at that. So I don't know if um, Mr. Sai has anything else he'd like to add to that or uh, clarify if in any way I've misspoken. And I have one follow up to that, Madam Chair, if I may. Yes, please. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Um, McComas. It's my understanding that athletic directors are having to um, do a lot of manual effort to determine eligibility. So the intent of my motion is to provide them with assistance from central office um, to be able to provide these reports, given that they have already begun this process and will now need to revisit eligibility and anything we can do to assist them would be helpful. Thank you. Right, Madam and, Chair, and I would say- Madam Chair, Daryl Williams, that's the work of operations and actually you heard Mr. Sai speak to the system improvement team looking at eligibility um, and they're looking at aspect of eligibility even at the middle school level. So I, I will I will go back to what Dr. McComas just shared earlier. Thank you. Okay. Madam Chair, may I ask a clarifying question quickly? Yes. Um, do we have the capability to provide these eligibility reports to our athletic directors? So I can respond to that. Um, we do have the ability, but I will be very transparent. Uh, in light of the ransomware attack, um, we did struggle initially to get the original uh, 2.0 with one failing grade reports in. Uh, we were able to overcome that. But now to go back and now have to change the requirements within the system, that is going to be something that's going to be a little bit more detailed that's going to have to be run through DUIT to get that report up and running. I do believe we have the ability to do it, but I don't think it's just a 
an easy fix in terms of getting those reports out. We will do everything that we can as it relates to this matter, but if, I, I don't want to set anyone up and just say, think it's going to report is going to come out tomorrow because it's not. Thank you, Mr. Sai. I appreciate that. And again, my intention is not to um, present more burden on central staff, but merely to um, drive an efficient process and rather than have ADs manually do this um, on their own, if there's something we can do centrally, I understand the limits um, due to the ransomware attack. So I certainly appreciate the efforts. And Madam Chair, should I restate my motion? And I was in the process of putting it in the chat. I would still yes, like to make it. Certainly, I thought you had put it in the chat. Yes, if you could restate it and put it in the chat, please. Thank you. Thank you. So it is, I further move that eligibility reports be provided to all middle and high schools. Okay, now this is a motion or this is a, an, an amendment? amendment. I'm oh. sorry, I, I move to amend the current motion by inserting, I further move that eligibility reports be provided to all middle and high schools. And where are you inserting it at in the motion? At the end of the motion, Madam Chair. Okay, so you're adding it to the end of the motion. Okay. Okay, all right. So um, I see. So you're adding it to the end, not inserting. Okay. And it was seconded by Ms. Causey, so I will restate it. Um, Ms. Hen um, uh, further um, would like to add at the end uh, an amendment to further move that eligibility reports be provided to all middle and high schools. Okay, so if amended, um, I'll read the full motion because we've had quite a bit of discussion. Um, Madam Chair, I move the question on the amendment. Okay, that's been moved and seconded um, and we can go ahead and, and vote on that. Ms. Gover, if you could take the roll call vote, please. I'm sorry, can I confirm the second? I think it was Ms. Rowe. Thank you. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomsa? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Ms. Fester? Abstain. Ms. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is okay. nine. Okay, so the amendment passes. Um, and I'm I would sorry, just like to add a motion no, to amend or a motion to move debate. Oh, we moved to end debate. Move yeah. the question. Oh, I'm sorry. We were moving, um, move the previous oh, question. Oh. I apologize. So now um, <laughs> that passed to move the question. Thanks. <laughs> so now um, the, um, the question is on the motion as amended. No. It's on the on Ms. Hen's amendment. Oh, that's right. We moved the question, so now we're voting on the amendment. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Ms. Rao? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jost? Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Abstain. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pester? Abstain. Ms. McCune? I'll abstain from this. It's already passed. Dr. Hager? 
No. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is six. Okay. So it failed. So the amendment fails. All right. And I saw there was some discussion. We did process the first amendment. This was the second amendment. So that so the second amendment fails. Um so now I believe everybody has had discussion on the original motion. And so we now need to process that. Um I have not um spoken yet. I would just like to ask um Mr. McMillian a clarifying question on the motion. I see that you're saying that um, it's to expire on June 30th, 2021. So, um, or maybe this is for staff, but what sports would that cover? I think you all had said earlier, but it would cover like the spring sports. Yes, it would cover this this fall and then subsequently the, the spring season that follows. Um, I have a question as well, but that's that's what it would cover. OK, it, because I guess what I was wondering is then what would that mean for children who who play sports that aren't included in that in that time frame? Like, would there be sports that would not be included? And then how would that be fair to those children then who um, didn't have the ability to play based on their GPA um, sports maybe that they wanted to participate in? Well, that's what I was saying earlier. You're still excluding kids. It, it's it's. It's just a matter of the bar being lowered. So there are still going to be parents that are going to question this motion uh, to the Office of Athletics and to the board itself because the kid has a 0.9 GPA or a 0.8 GPA, but still has struggles at home regarding um, COVID and learning virtually and all the other things that we've discussed in this meeting. So it's, okay. it's, it just it just moved the goalposts. It, it, you, you're still going to have these same concerns from other parents who kids are just being um they aren't going to make that requirement but had the same struggles that made okay. us make this in the first place because i guess what i'm trying to figure out is that uh take away the gpa but uh children who for for all um extensive purposes would be able to participate in spring sports and then when the new year started then those same children or other children would not be able to participate any longer so that is in a, in a sense excluding um, certain groups of children. So uh, that that that's my concern because then and then also children who would have opportunity to play and then if they don't get their GPAs up, then would be um, once this expires would then be put off whatever team they were on, which could also have an impact. Um, and then also I just see um, uh, questions that could arise around parents. You know, this is something that their child did and enjoyed and really um, did well. And then, you know, maybe it did get their grades up, but then maybe it wasn't up to a 2.0 and then having it. Yeah, it, it just seems like a can of worms. But also, um, I was wondering, Mr. Sai, if you could say, um, what impact do we think this would have on children who have been working hard to keep their grades up, who look at playing sports as a privilege? Um, and then having, um, if, if this were to go in, what would that mean for those children who've been working hard, keeping their grades up, doing well? Um, I, I just wonder um, if someone could speak to that, what impact that would have on those students? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I, I don't want to speak for the kids because everybody um, feels differently, no different than when I discussed about us um, interviewing kids regarding eligibility, but I know that uh, many kids have discussed um, that this is a, a privilege and not a right, and they feel very strongly about the academic requirements and and what it has done for them in terms of getting them prepared for real life in terms of having a standard and having to meet it. Um, that was mm -hmm. the one interesting thing that has come out of uh, out of our eligibility um, committee to see that our kids do believe that it's important. Our kids do believe that we should have it because it's only going to make them better. So I, I can't tell you what each kid feels individually. I can tell you that some of the kids that we interviewed uh, did feel strongly about the um, uh, about the about the rule, and that also um, thought that we should be putting some things in place to try to help those kids that are are, are struggling regarding the rule. 
Okay, and then my last question is, how would this impact, um, I guess, uh, uh, if we were to play against another team, wouldn't that mean, couldn't that mean that a game could be forfeited because we had ineligible players who didn't meet the academic requirements or state requirements? I, I, I guess I just wonder if that could have an impact on a win. No, at this point in time, um, with the amendment that Mr. McMillian has put forth, uh, it, this should not have any impact uh, regarding um, uh, forfeiture or anything like that. Currently, uh, as it as it is right now, we're we're only uh, we're scheduled. Let me say that to compete against only schools within Baltimore County because we're not um, traveling outside of our district as it relates to COVID. So um, as of right now, it would be an internal thing that we're doing. And if we if we move to the point where we're um, competing against teams outside of Baltimore County at a state competition, it wouldn't it wouldn't have an impact. OK, thank you for that. Madam Chair, um, if I may add that I think Dr. McComas wants to make a comment. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Williams. I actually was, um, I wanted to make sure um, Mr. Sai got a chance to add comments. So I was really doing that for an opportunity for him to speak again. So thank you, Dr. Williams, for <laughs> taking care of staff. <laughs> no, so I appreciate that. And, and again, my, my, my question is shortened to, to the point. When we talk about this um, uh, amendment to the policy uh, and with the expiration date of, I think um, Mr. McMillian said June 30th, um, how is this this going to impact the fall season of 2021? Again, fourth quarter grades impact eligibility for the next quarter. If kids are going for the minimum of a 1.0 with one failing grade and the new GPA, I mean, the original policy kicks back in July 1, we're going to have a lot of kids that are probably going to be missing the bar because they've been aiming low. Okay. Thank you for that. So um, I think that it's time we do need to process this motion. Um, so, um, Ms. Gober, if we could take a roll call vote, please, on Mr. McMillian's motion. As amended. Ms. Brown? Thank yes. you. Ms. Brown? Yes. Ms. Coffey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jeff? Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? No. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is eight. Okay. So the motion uh, carries as amended. It will be retroactive to scrolling through here, February 12th. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. And so uh, moving on to the next agenda item. Um, the next agenda item is the re recommendation for in-person board meetings. And for that, I call on Dr. Zarchin. Ms. Oh, I'm sorry. Was there another comment? Yeah, Ms. Scott, this is Mr. McMillian. I have another comment. Oh, yes, Mr. McMillian. Sorry, I didn't see you there. Thank you. Can we go back to the athletic slide, please, Dr. Sarchin? Yeah. On the second item, I return to play committee with no spectators. Can we briefly talk about that as a board? And is there any way that we can negotiate this and come to an agreement where, and I understand the importance of chaperones, I understand that, but is there any way that we can negotiate this with paid security or some, some way to negotiate this so that parents, at, at the minimum, a few parents can see their kids play? Thank you. So uh, I'll get us started, Mr. McMillian. Um, you know, as you are well aware, Mr. McMillian, as the chaperones required, and particularly if you're at a high school where you have multiple events happening at the same time, and you fully understand how we typically have teachers 
um, serve as duty assignments to come and help with the chaperones. We have explored some of the security companies, as I also know you're well aware of how challenging it is um, to um, try to prevent someone who's not supposed to be joining a game to join. Um, and some of those companies have not made it through um, the uh, economic impact of the pandemic. And I don't know if Mr. Sai would like to add any more because I know he's been involved in direct conversations with their uh, safety team around trying to um, secure additional security. So thank you, Ms. McComas. So again, Rod, again, I understand uh, your concern and many of the parents' concern as it relates to their um, attending their children's uh, athletic events. Um, I, I wish just as many as as many of these guys that we could do it, but right now uh, we're just currently understaffed. Um, uh, Ms. McComas just um, talked to you about uh, some of the challenges. We had five uh, companies that offered security uh, and I believe all but two folded and they're probably two of the smaller ones. And when you have 24 high schools with nine sports per, uh, this season going on with multiple games on campus, it's just, it's just hard, almost impossible. Um, again, you know as well as I know that it takes a village and the village isn't there because school's not in. We won't have teachers back to assist. We don't have security to assist. And there's one athletic director with multiple events going on. Just some, some other little notes. We had 346 contracted coaches, 108 decided not to come back because of COVID. So we're, we're having some of the same struggles that the, that the system as a whole are having in our department. And we had 17 athletic trainers, only nine came back. So again, we're trying to work through all this. Uh, it's it's um, really uh, been a, a challenge and we want the parents. And, and, and again, we believe it's just initially until we get teachers back in the building and starting to get them to come assist us. But um, as of right now, I think it's just gonna be a situation where we can't provide the safest environment for our student athletes. Okay, thank you for that. It looks like we, um, and I just wanted to ask board members, are these questions related to reopening or still to sports? Because I, I mean, we are on the same subject. So um, looks like we have Dr. Hager. I think Ms. Jost was ahead of me. Oh, I thought I, I think I had you before Ms. Jost, but that's fine. Ms. Jost, if you're there. Yes, I am. Uh, I just want to make a comment that this board just spent over an hour talking about sports and not enough time talking about curriculum and instruction. The pandemic has exposed the kids that we are failing and I have not seen that much passionate plea about uh, the racial inequities in our system facing and how these kids are failing. We're bringing them back. We're going to give them standardized testing, which they're not equipped to do. And we don't spend time as, as leadership even mentioning that, but we've spent just over an hour uh, debating the sports motion. So I'm just disappointed and it's almost 10 o'clock. So I really would like to move along for interest of time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jose. Um, yeah, OK, uh, Dr. Hager. Um, my comment is to Mr. McMillian's question, and I did include this in my written comments uh, based on some questions that I had received from uh, several teachers who have children who are playing sports and who felt that by having to return to school and teach in person, but then not being allowed to walk outside of their own building and watch their child play soccer, um, they didn't feel that that was right. So is there any way that a person with a BCPS badge would be allowed to watch as a spectator who's uh, a teacher or staff member who's uh, physically in there working for us could potentially be a spectator or is it a hard line in the sand, no spectators? If you're asking me right now, it's a hard line in the sand, but obviously um, the board has uh, some say in this. Uh, the reality of it is, is that we're understaffed. I don't know how else to say it. If you were to talk to any one of the, the 24 athletic directors, if you would speak to the principals at the schools, they have some major concerns regarding providing a safe environment as it relates to the CDC and the COVID guidelines that we have on protecting our student athletes, the gate as, as a result of, uh, of, of money, social distancing in the stands. I mean, the list goes on and on, not having the trainers. Again, I want to see the parents back. I want the kids to see their parents in the stands, but at what cost? And again, that's, and again, and, and, I'm, and I'm saying this with all sincerity, sincerity, this is initially, again, when we start returning to play, which is scheduled tentatively right now, uh, for uh, March the 5th, 
Um, and that's, you know, depending on more weather and we've only been in practice four days out of the, the amount of days that we've, you know, we've been had the ability to do this. Uh, we want to get um, them back, but we need help. We, we can't do it um, with one athletic director and the coaches responsible for the kids on the field. I mean, we, we need our staff to, to help us get through this. And as soon as we get the teachers back in the building and start uh, getting them developed in terms of what it, it takes to help us run these games, then then we can definitely look at, um, you know, having, you know, parents, the you know, what the um, county exec said in terms of the one parent per kid and that kind of stuff and trying to institute some of those things. But right now, I'm just telling, I'm just being very honest with you um, as it relates to our ability to not have security not have teachers, only one AD, and then trying to put X amount of parents inside of a gymnasium or inside of a stadium is, is, is pretty close to impossible. All right, thank you for that. Next, um, it looks like we have a, um, a question from Mr. Mahomza. Thank um, Dr. Williams, um, with, I know that the, this, the announcement with testing was made uh, for uh, I believe the middle schoolers, but I, I was curious to know uh, wh where, what is the discussion with BCPS regarding like finals and other um, end of the year uh, examinations, especially for high schoolers, especially for those um, graduating? Uh, I think that's the, as you mentioned, the announcement about testing that's something we're going to have to look at as well the logistics around that yeah. and when you're talking about the end of the year are you talking about seniors or just in general no um no i think the testing was concerning if i'm not mistaken was concerning like state and federal standardized tests I, I, i'm talking about like final exams or like each course the ones that count towards like gpa and um how that's counted up for high schoolers mainly. So as Dr. Uh, Wheatley Phillip talked about, we, we're going to have to look at all of that because um, it's going to be a, a scheduling piece that we will have to look at. I, I'm not able to provide any additional information about the exams at this time. OK. Uh, yeah, no, that was just my one question. A lot of them have been and answered by board members. Thank you. Um, next, it looks like we have a question from Mr. McMillian. Yeah, real quick. Uh, for those that know me, this is I'm, I'm a proactive kind of guy. I don't want the athletic directors out there facing spectators by themselves. Uh, anybody that knows me, I did this 25 years. I managed, realistically, I'm not exaggerating this, a couple thousand events, home school events. There's going to be spectator issues. There's going to be people that want to see their sons play high school football. So you're going to put the, the athletic director in that situation by himself. There's, there's somehow we can work this out. Whether we talk to Chief Hyatt, these school resource officers are going to be in buildings with 40% of kids in the building. Is there any way that, and I know their schedules come into play, is there any way that we can schedule the resource officers to come in in the afternoon to help supervise some of these activities? We cannot put these athletic directors out there to manage the game activities and, and do crowd control. And there's going to be people show up that want to watch. Thank you. All right. Thank you for that, Mr. McMillian. And um, it looks like, um, Members have used their time for speaking. Um, thank you for that, Mr. Brusades. And it looks like there is a follow-up question for Ms. Jost. Please go ahead. Ms. Scott, I'll you my timelines for the board opening. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, so if we could please move on. Um, and I just apologize to our public who have joined in to hear all of the agenda items and we have not gotten to those yet. Um, we are severely behind time. Um, so if we could move on to the next agenda item. Ms. Joes, uh, excuse me, Madam Chair, this is Ms. Clausey. <laughs> I, I had Scott. a comment. I know, I had a comment okay. after Mr. McMillian, but I, I would like to hear a response like from staff to his time. question. 
It looked like you had used up your time. That was why I said that. Um, because we, well, we I all think other board members had used up their time as well. But I, but Mr. 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 asked a good question, and, and, I, and I think staff should be, be able to answer it. Time and everything so that everybody has a chance to talk. We have exhausted this. We've ruminated this. Um, we need to move on. May we please move on? We have other agenda items that are equally as important. So I'm asking the board if we can please move on so that we can process our agenda. We have some very important items to get to. And we have the public who um, are watching, our stakeholders who are wanting to have information given to them that they expect us to be a functioning board that we can move past one agenda item. So I'm asking board members if we can please move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the recommendation for in-person board meetings, which is extremely important. And I venture that a lot of people would like to hear about that. So um, I would just, you know, ask um, Dr. Williams if we could move on to that. And if and for that, I call on Dr. Zarchin if he is available, please. Dr. Zarchin. Yes, I'm available and happy to start. Thank you, uh, please start. So at the beginning of the school year, uh, facilities management, school safety, health services, and we reached out to the Baltimore County Department of Health to come up with recommendations for uh, board meetings, a hybrid board meeting. Um, we have revised those recommendations and I just want to go through the list of recommendations for the, the board meeting. So uh, social distancing and masks would be required. Um, as part of facilities work, they have gone through and made sure that filters are changed as required. Uh, the duration of meetings would be recommended to be as brief as possible uh, with these hybrid meetings. Uh, congregating would be um, not supported before and after the meetings and because of uh, ventilation the atrium we would prefer not being used uh, as far as board members at the dais uh, it would be no more than half the board members uh, seated at the dais for meetings and we would have to spread out beyond that dais um, seating would be limited um, and the the boardroom at this point when we reached out to our partners in Baltimore County. We are still under a 10 person uh, per in uh, building meeting limit right now. That may change with the metrics changing. Uh, we're still waiting to hear back uh, on that. So the other piece would be staff and speakers. The recommendation is that they attend virtually to keep the numbers down and, and maintain social distancing. Also, you know, eating before, during, and after meetings would be uh, discouraged or not recommended, and hallway and bathroom use would be limited to ensure social distancing. Uh, so that is uh, the recommendation for hybrid board meetings. Uh, the other piece is it would be important to know in advance what board members are attending those meetings so we can plan accordingly. Okay, is that the end of the presentation? Yes, it is. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like we have questions from board members, starting first with Ms. Jones. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Dr. Zarchin, when you talk about time limits, what is the time limit? Because just giving by this, this board meeting has been going on for the past four or five hours. So what is the time limit when you talk about, when you're talking about uh, the location, is that going to be in Greenwood where we usually have our meetings? And, um, you know, also find this a bit, um, troubling because we are starting schools and we're bringing our teachers and uh, kids back and yet you know we have all of these restrictions for 12 board members so i, I don't think that's fair uh, but if you could answer uh, the question on time limits thank you sure so the basically what we want to limit it to is the essential time needed um, in that room the the boardroom would be needed because of technology needs so that is why we've selected the boardroom. Um, as far as the difference between schools and the board, uh, schools do not have the same standards uh, for meeting. There's there's a, a different expectation. And as I mentioned, 
the 10 person limit is likely to change or I expect that it would change as the numbers come down. But at this point, we have not received word uh, that 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 minimum would be lifted. So when you say 10 person, Dr. Zarchin, does that include um, staff as well, Tracy and uh, other staff that are critical for um, having this meeting live? It, yes, it would. So that would be less than half of the board members would be willing, uh, would be able to attend in person. Would we be open to having public comment in person? Not at this time, no. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, next looks like we have a question from Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Dr. Zarchin, um, Ms. Jones answered, asked most of the questions that I had, mm -hmm. um, but just to clarify, in the room we currently meet in, you're saying that only 10 people could be there for the meeting time. Everyone else has to be virtual. That's correct, and that's due not due to social distancing, but because of the county restriction or, or maximum you know, numbers of folks for a meeting at this time. Again, I expect that that will change in time, but right now when we reached out to our partners in Baltimore County, um, we did not get an answer that that had changed yet. Okay, and with that, just to reiterate, there would be no public allowed, correct? Correct. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Next is Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Um, and I just would want to say that there were a lot more issues that I would have liked to address at reopening, including teachers and so forth, but having a limit of two minutes We've moved per on agenda past item is rather policy. limiting. We've moved so, on past that. We're in a new excuse me? I'm sorry, excuse me? We've moved on past that. We're now um, in, a, in discussing the um, returning of the board. So if your question is related to that, please go ahead. Um, so my understanding is I have two minutes. So, um, the question that I have, Dr. Zarshan, thank you for preparing this. Um, we were told that by having the board meetings in the meeting room that we would have some additional functionality to the Microsoft Teams, including the raise a hand your raise a hand feature. Would we also have additional functionality so we could have call in from the uh, public and our stakeholders? So I, I can't speak to that. Um, I, I know that the, the plan was to have a large panel uh, facing the board, that that would be available. Uh, the call in, uh, I know there'd be a video stream or live stream. I don't know about the opportunity to have a call in. Is there someone, the board. Is, is there someone from technical staff that can address that question? Mr. Corns, do you have a response to that question at this time, or is that something we're going to have to circle back and give an update on? Dr. Scriven, we could do a uh, call in from the board, uh, for the, from the boardroom to uh, bring bring uh, individuals in as we had done in the past when we were still there. So that it would increase the engagement and transparency for our public by being able to have all of our stakeholders and then the 10 persons from public, is that correct? So Hello? yes, I, I'm not sure if that was directed uh, to me or Mr. Corns. Yes, I was just trying to clarify what he was saying. Uh, I mean, Ms. Causey, the engagement of the of the call in feature would allow for presentation of uh, public comment. Great, thank you. Uh, the other thing is I, I, I will uh, plan to attend and um, I appreciate you putting this together. Do we need to make a motion to approve this or to? Can we do it at the next meeting? Do does the board need to provide any uh, preference or direction? I think at this point it, it's it's what you'd like to do. I don't know if that needs a vote. Uh, we're ready to to begin with this plan. OK, thank you. I'll just wait till other board members have an opportunity to speak. Thanks. Thank you. OK, 
Thank you, um, Mr. McMillian. Not me, not me. Not you? Oh, OK. OK, <laughs> Ms. Mack. Um, Dr. Sarchin, thank you for this information. It, if I'm doing the count correctly and I'm looking over my computer, we would have Dr. Williams, the board chair, the vice chair, and then would in addition, would it be four other people at the dais? Because you said six board members, so it would be six board members, Dr. Williams. Is that correct? Six total at, at the dais. So five board members and Dr. Williams. Correct. Then we have Tracy, um, board council, school council. That takes us up to nine. Is that correct? I believe so, yes. And I imagine um, we would have somebody from your department there as we typically do at board meetings. So is it possible that other board members could join the meeting from the room where we would typically um, take a dinner break? As long as we um, we have the technology to do that, that would be another question for Mr. Corns, but yes, I, I, that would be fine. Mr. Corns. Uh, Dr. Zarchin, the only uh, concern we would need to have with that is that it, the board members gathered in that room would have to be around one camera uh, to oh. preclude feedback. Um, so um, if the ask would be to spread the board members throughout the building in different offices areas or different rooms so that we'd have one per each to limit the amount of uh, echo or feedback that we would get from multiple devices. Um, uh, and uh, Ms. Mack, the only other ad that I would put is there would be technical staff in the boardroom as well to run right. the meeting itself. So, I mean, it sounds to me like practically speaking, at least half of board members will have to join virtually. Am I thinking incorrectly? I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Just doing the math and then with Mr. Corns pointing out that um, IT staff would be in there also, it sounds to me like that at least half of board members have to plan to join board meetings virtually. At this point, until the the maximum is lifted, that is the case. OK, well then I guess um, I guess what I'd like to talk about is how that's going to be rotated and I don't know that we need to do it tonight, but it is a question that I would have. I'm finished, Miss Scott. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Uh, it looks like we have Ms. Rill. Yeah, so maybe this seems a little bit obvious, but our meetings last longer than the three hour period that you stated last time. And we're jumping through a lot of hoops to try to attend in person, but our entire constituency is still going to be attending virtually, along with all the staff who attend virtually, along with half of the board. How is any of that and jumping through hoops to do that different than what we're doing now, except that now we can actually work through our whole agenda in the same time frame that we would normally if we're meeting all in person. But now we're gonna cut our meetings down to only three hours and not finish the workload that we normally finish so that some of us can be in the same room together, but none of our constituents can. I don't see how the benefit outweighs the risk and the complications of doing this. Okay, thank you, Ms. Rell. Um, and I didn't want to overlook anyone. Were there any additional questions or comments that I missed? Okay. I had one, Madam Chair. I just put it in the Ms. chat. Hen. Okay, yes, please go ahead, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, just for my own clarification and to follow up on Ms. Rowe's question, um, it was my understanding from Dr. Zarshan's comments that 
we are not under a specific time limit, although it's suggested that we keep business to that which is essential. Is that correct? That, well, that is correct, is yes. Okay, so the three hours does not apply. No, we've, we've looked at it again and, and gotten feedback. It's what we want to do is focus on what's essential mm -hmm. and needed and try to keep it to that. Thank you. And yeah. as far as you're concerned, then board members, all 12 could, assuming the technology is in place, we could all be in person if we were um, scattered throughout Greenwood, let's say, if we all wanted to be in the same physical building, but in separate spaces apart. I I don't see where that would be a problem. OK, and I defer to Mr. Corns, but um, we've asked him enough questions on this topic. So thank you, Dr. Zarchin. You're welcome. OK, were there any additional questions before we move on to the next item on the agenda? I, I'm, I'm sorry, I have a I have a question. This is Aaron Hager. Um, I asked, I, I believe I asked last time about the committee meetings. I just want a clarification. Is this just about our full board of ed meetings or also our different committee meetings? So this is specific to the board meetings. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That was all I wanted. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Hager and Ms. Calzi, you have a question? Yes, thank you. Um, I move that the board, um, adopts these recommendations for future hybrid board meetings um, at the next scheduled board meeting. Could you put that in the chat, please? And is there a second? Okay. I have a question before I second that. Well, right. I don't know that we can discuss it without it being seconded. Mr. Mercedes, can we discuss a motion um, before it's properly seconded? It should be seconded. Then and I'll second it. Yes. I'll second it. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, Ms. Causey, could you please put the motion in the chat so that I can state it? Yeah. And then we can discuss it, please. <laughs> okay. So Ms. Causey has made a motion. To move that the board adopt the recommendations presented for future hybrid board meetings starting with the next meeting and that was seconded by Mr. McMillian. So yes, uh, Mr. McMillian, you can go ahead with your question. I just wanted to clarify the next meeting. So we're talking about March 9th, starting this March 9th, correct? Ms. Causey, could you speak to your motion? Yes, that's correct. Thank you. OK, all right. Are there any additional questions or can we process this motion? OK, hearing no additional questions, Ms. Gover, could we take a roll call vote, please? Ms. Ross? No. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jones? Ms. Jost? Oh. Ms. Han? Yes. Mr. Mahamza? Yes. Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pasture? No. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? No. Favor is seven, opposed is four, one absent. Okay, favor seven. I just wanted to uh, make sure I had that correct, Ms. Gover. That's correct. Okay. Okay, then so let's see the motion then carries. All right, were there any additional questions or anything in regards to this agenda item? Okay. All right, so then um, moving on, the next item on the agenda is the consideration of the superintendent's proposed fiscal year 2022 operating budget. And for that, I call on Dr. Scriven and Mr. Saris. 
Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we are coming before the board this evening uh, seeking approval uh, on the proposed FY 2022 uh, superintendent's budget uh, for Baltimore County. Uh, Mr. Saris and team are available to fill any additional questions. Uh, there have been documents uh, that have been provided uh, to give an overview of the motions which were made uh, by the board at our last uh, meeting uh, or our last work session, I should say. Uh, so at this time, I want to turn it over uh, to you, Madam Chair, and uh, the board members uh, for any clarifying questions that you may have of our team uh, prior to seeking your approval. Thank you for that. Uh, it looks like we have a question in the chat from Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Khan. Um, Dr. Scrivens and Mrs. Saras, if you could uh, tell how much the amended budget, is that still at MOE or has it gone up about MOE and what is the dollar amount? I think I remember seeing 71 million, but I may be wrong. Is that accurate? So what is the overall budget pegged at now? Yeah, Mrs. Saras, could you be so kind just to uh, go over the two additional documents or the one pager, uh, which gives a summation of the motions and uh, subsequently uh, how those amended amendments have impacted the overall budget? Uh, yes, so there were uh, six uh, amendments uh, uh, approved by the board on the 16th. Uh, the, the total uh, net increase is 71.6 million, which is 13.7% above maintenance of effort. And that includes uh, a 3.5 million uh, reduction to pay for increased school budgets and uh, the uh, increased uh, family engagement proposal. Ms. Scott, I have a, a motion if I could. Um, yes, Ms. Jones. Thank you. I move to amend the proposed budget to increase the Baltimore County Student Council's budget allocation under family community engagement from $30,427 to $50,000. Okay, is there a second to Ms. Joseph's motion? Second, Ms. Hen. Thank you for that. Um, Ms. Hen and Ms. Joseph, could you please put your motion in the chat so that I may properly restate it? Yes, ma'am. Right. Thank you. Okay. So the motion has been stated um, by Ms. Joes. I move to amend the proposed budget to increase the Baltimore County Student Council's budget allocation under family community engagement from $30,427 to $50,000. And it was seconded by Ms. Hen. Um, Ms. Joes, would you like to speak to your motion? Um, no, I, I'm. the motion is pretty self clear, but you know, I, Thank you. OK. Uh, looks like we have a question on the budget. Oh, you have a question on the budget, not on this. One. OK, <laughs> thank you, Ms. May. <laughs> OK, are there any uh, questions on um, the motion? Uh, yes, I OK, I think you came after Mr. Mahomes. Uh, Mr. Mahomes, is your question or comment on this motion? Yes. OK, so Mr. Mahomes and then Ms. Rowe. Was that you, Ms. Rowe, I believe? Yes. Okay, yeah. thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Mahomza. Yeah, I fully support this motion. Um, being SMOB this year and also an executive board member on the county student councils last year, um, I've heard um, not only from students, but from um, the advisors themselves about how um, at times the budget, um, there's not enough funds in the budget to do a lot of the activities or events. Um, and that means that we can't uh, bring every student. So we there's um, 
not that equity uh, because we're, the student council has been trying to promote, promote equity, um, increase opportunities um, to schools that usually are not participating, but um, with our funds, uh, especially with transportation um, and things dealing with um, um, miscellaneous things dealing with uh, renting venues and student lunch lunches, um, there's usually not enough funds. And um, although 50,000, um, they said it might not fully um, fund all the programs uh, the students want to engage in, um, it helps and um, it makes sure that next year's uh, budget, it, it, there's still funds there and it's um, um, and student council, the student council are not looking for funds elsewhere. Um, that's my only comment. Thank you for that, Mr. Mahamza. And next is Ms. Rowe. Yes, I have some questions for staff about this budget item. Um, I would like to know what the money in this um, budget item is, the money that's currently there, what types of things it's spent for, and what additional things would be provided by additional money. OK, yeah, if staff could address it. Um, for um, Ms. Rell, please. Is there staff available? Is, to there, or is the question about the student council item? Yes, the student count. Well, that's the motion, right? So. The student yeah. council budget allocation under family community engagement. That is 30,427 that Ms. Joes has moved to increase to $50,000. I would like to know what the money that's currently there is spent for and what the additional money would be spent for. I'm not intimately familiar, but I think they use it for um, travel. And um, I think Mr. Mahamza uh, really mentioned a number of the things they do and they would do uh, with that increased budget, but it's to uh, you know support the councils to get together and do uh, different events, supplies, but uh, to get into more detail than that, uh, would have to get back to you unless uh, someone on the call today has more intimate details. Mr. Tantliff, this is Michael Dickerson. Uh, Ms. Rowe, what Mr. Mahamza and Mr. Tantliff have stated is true. There are often times that um, Ms. Nora Murray has to work with colleagues in the communications department to see if they can help with funding some of the activities that she tries to help the students do. Um, I think uh, oftentimes the students don't get to take as many uh, members to events or have to curtail the types of events they can look to take part in because there's not the budget there that, that they would like to have. So does this support every student council in every school or is there like a centralized student? I'm I'm not entirely familiar with how student council works. Right, so there's the Baltimore County student councils and obviously there are members from uh, the middle and high schools they are even looking at starting to engage some fourth and fifth graders, I believe. But but for the purpose of your question, yes, uh, students from all schools are represented at the middle and high school level, but there's a central Baltimore County student councils. OK, so about how many students does this amount of money support? I don't have that answer readily available. Like less than 100? More than a thousand, roughly, ballpark. Um, may I answer that? Sure. Yeah, I don't have the exact figures, but how um, the Baltimore County Student Council works, especially with their events. Um, uh, what we do is we we invite um, a group of students from each um, middle and high school. Obviously, it's not going to be uh, all because. Um, a lot of the high schools, some of them don't participate or uh, like um, I mentioned earlier, there's not enough money in the budget um, to pay for transportation um, to provide for food because we a lot of the events we're providing students with meals um, and just other things um, like supplies they have to buy. Um, 
there's not enough for that. But uh, I don't have the exact figure, but it's uh, I some events I think go over 100, but I, I would have to follow up on that. What's an example of an event? Um, so, for example, um, the previous, like I'm going to give the example from um, the previous student board member, um, how the elections used to work. Um, um, they would have a, a, a SMOB convention where uh, they would meet at a high school and each school, each high and high school and middle school would have to bring two delegate, two voting delegates to vote for the next student board member. And they would ask, um, um, they would ask this, the candidates questions and um, um, then they'll do the voting. Obviously, the voting has changed now, but there are still the uh, elections of the uh, they have the general assembly where they elect new officers. Um, they pass legislation that pertains to um, students and advocacy. Um, they have workshops where there's mental health uh, work. There's workshops concerning mental health, um, concerning uh, climate change, concerning um, different things and advocacies. Um, and they are inviting pretty much all student councils, but obviously um, not all schools are able to make them. Or it's a tense. OK, I think the board actually some members actually attended an event like this when there was a, a student board member election. So we're talking about roughly that number of people. It almost fills an auditorium, a small yeah. auditorium. Yeah. OK, OK, thank you. That answered my questions. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, were there any additional questions? Uh, it looks like. Um, well, we haven't heard from Ms. Hen yet. Um, so um, Ms. Joseph, Ms. Hen can go and then you can go. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Joseph can go. My question is on another item on this agenda item. So thank you. Madam. Oh, it's, sorry, I thought it was on the motion. OK, no, my apologies. Thank you. No worries. Yes, Ms. Joseph. No, I have nothing. We can vote. Thank you. OK, great. All right. Um, so since there are no additional questions, Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jose? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahamsa? I can't vote. I'm sorry. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The motion carries. OK, and so now I will um, go. There's looks like there's questions on the budget, so I'm going in order as I see it. Um, it looks like it's Ms. Hen and then Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a question regarding one of the board's amendments. Um, that's reflected on the summary as an increase. However, the motion was to reallocate funds, and this was to increase the per pupil allocation to schools. If someone could address that. Um, yes, uh, Ms. Han, on the summary, mm -hmm. uh, you'll note uh, item four, this should be done by reducing funds from other areas of the budget, and then below, are the board reductions of $3,510,729, which we hope uh, captured the essence of, of your motion. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Sears. I'm looking for that. Um, there's a Word document I might be able to share. Um, well, I guess I don't know that I can do that. I'm not, <laughs> I may not have that control. It's titled Board Proposed Budget Amendments, February 16th, 2021. So this is in one of the documents that's attached to board docs or this is a different document? Yeah, this is uh, in board docs. And George, I, I believe this may be a, a different document that you're referencing. Mm -hmm. 
Right. I'm not seeing that in right. what were provided. And and Tracy, oh, I'm if, sorry. If, right, Tracy, if possible, uh, yeah. can we upload that to War Docs? Uh, that is a document that we did not attach. Dr. Skirvin, let me locate that first. Thank you. Okay. Ms. Ten, is there any so, other clarity you need around that question? My concern is that the motion was not to increase the proposed budget, but rather to reallocate. So the document FY 2022 BCPS budget, well, actually the name is BCPS summary by initiative, with board amendments um, seems misleading to indicate that it is an increase when in fact the board approved a reallocation. So the overall net, in other words, it's a net neutral amendment rather than a 3.3 million increase, which isn't reflected on this document, nor in the overall um, change to the proposed budget of the 71 um, and a half million. So, Ms. Sahan, if we look at the landscape document entitled FY 2022 BCPS budget by performance goals, uh, and we go all the way over to the right hand column, the first two numbers are the per pupil change that you that the board approved and the family engagement uh, proposal and then the reduction of three million five hundred ten thousand uh, equals those two uh, those first two items so it is a, a zero-sum impact. Okay. Um, I I would like I'm to still... ask a, I would like to ask a follow up clarification because. Oh, okay. Yes, please do. Thank you, Madam Chair. The could you, um, Mr. Sarris, please clarify which columns you see those as being offset? Yeah, it's the uh, column, the furthest column to the right, mm -hmm. uh, which is incorrectly titled FY21 proposed, but it is. Uh, it should be FY22 uh, change, I guess, is the heading of that column. Okay, I see that amount listed under um, that FY21 proposed as well as in non salary. You're saying those? Yes. It's not uh, listed um, as a decrease in either of those. It appears to be an increase unless I'm reading it incorrectly. Well, I'm reading it as as a balanced uh, entry. Um, are you so? You see, there's there's two increased amounts and an amount in parentheses. And that those are a net zero change to the proposed budget. We may be looking at, oh, I do see that under subtotal academics. Um, I'm looking at a doc, uh, a, a landscape document, mm -hmm. FY 2022 BC budget by performance goals. Yes. Yeah. So, Ms. Hen, do you see in the bottom of the learning accountability results, it's board mandated reductions? And if you look to the right, it's 3510729. Yes. That's the sum of the two reductions initiatives that Mr. Saris mentioned, the 175,000 plus okay. the per pupil increase. Thank you, Mr. Tantla. So that is reflected then in the um, 
net change over the superintendent's proposed. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time, gentlemen. Thanks for that clarification. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you. Next, we have a question. Looks like from Ms. Causey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have a couple of comments and then some questions. Um, I just want to state uh, the board just received um, these final uh, budget documents from staff this afternoon. Um, so that's why there's some uh, reevaluating of them and asking for clarification. Um, this time crunch could have been avoided if we were allowed to do uh, board motions at earlier work sessions. That being said, the Office of Communications, it, was that corrected for the removal of the Chief Communications Office Officer? Um, the, the budget book uh, was correct. That was the total communications office. And if you um, compared the FY20 budget versus the FY21 budget, you would see um, a $200,000 plus reduction in that office. It's not apparent in the 22 budget book, though, because you see FY20 actuals, and that position was vacant for most of the year. That's why it um, appeared to be flat, but the uh, position did come out in FY21, or it got reclassified. Thank you. Um, and at the last meeting, there was um, policy that was written that spoke to uh, the board needing to approve organizational changes at a certain level. So <clears throat> I would request that all organizational changes per that policy are provided to the board in the weekly update that have occurred in the uh, past 18 months. Dr. Williams, is that something that staff can provide? So, um, uh, Ms. Colsey, is that a motion or are you just a, uh, just asking if that's something that? Just a request. Okay. Yeah, Ms. Uh, Ms. Colsey, if you could just pose that as a question for us uh, and email it, we will definitely generate a response. Okay, and we had also uh, discussed board members' questions in board meetings being tracked by staff and followed up on, but I will send that email. Next, could I ask staff to go through each of the additions, particularly add 15 minutes to the school day, um, the increase is listed as 27 million and just kind of break that down, please. Um, sure. Go ahead, Mr. Taylor. Okay, which document are you looking at, Ms. Causey? So the one that's four columns. Down. What's that? The one page summary that has four columns. It, it's not really clear which edition. What's the title of it? Fiscal year 2022 BCPS budget by performance goals. Gotcha. Okay. Um, well, the, so the the benefit portion of that is separate from the salary portion with. Yeah, so. I'm just getting the file up properly, yes. So the 27 million uh, does not include approximately $2 million in benefits, which you can see is a couple lines down in the $9.4 million line item. That includes um, the difference of benefits for all the initiatives that the board added. So the 15 uh, minute initiative is uh, TAPCO, ESPBC, AAs, et cetera. Um, it includes the 2% COLA that the board added. 
Um, and that's uh, what it came out to, 27.6 million plus uh, the associated fringe benefits, which in this case ended up, uh, the initiative in total was 29 million, 898,909. Did you say that include the additional COLA? Yes. Okay, so then that's not specific to the 15 minutes a day. Well, it's the value of the 15 minutes based on the salaries that'll be in effect next year, which would include your two, the 2% 2 COLA. I mean, it's a very small percent of it. But it's not, so it's not clearly just the 15 minutes a day because yes, there were different motions. The, no, but it's just the, it's, it's the value of next year's salaries um, calculated to 15 minutes. But next year's salaries now have an extra 2%. So we just incorporated everything together into that initiative for the 15 minutes. It's based on next year's salaries. Okay, and how many personnel does that impact? Um, I don't have that off the top of my head, but it would probably be in the neighborhood of 12,000 people. And so if the 2% COLA is not approved by the county, that number for the 15 minute day actually goes down. Is that correct? Yes, it would go down by several hundreds thousands of dollars. Um, I would request that that be clarified and separate line items in the budget so that it's clear to the county when it goes over to them. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Palsy. Um, so I just like want to say I have a number of other things to discuss, but I only have two minutes, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, looks like we have next Ms. Mack. Um, yes, my question is around um, the line item, and I'm looking at the the document FY 2022 BCPS budget by performance goals. And my question is around the teaching positions for enrollment growth. <clears throat> and the superintendent's proposed budget, um, he was seeing a gain of 6.9 million by not filling those 122.3 positions. Under the board proposed budget, those that $6.9 million is shown there again. And to the best of my knowledge, I don't believe there were any motions that touched that. So I'm wondering why that is not carried over into the far right column, the $6.9 million reduction. Um, it's not a change. The far right column is the changes that the board made last meeting. So uh, you can see for that item, the board proposed budget matches the superintendent's proposed budget, so the change is zero. The sum of the columns on the right, 71,593, is the total cost of the initiatives um, netting out the reductions that were mandated in the last meeting. Okay, thank you, Mr. Tantliff. And then I have one more quick question. Um, in the motion that I made for the 35.6, um, increase that's under safe and supportive environment, the school counselor, social workers. When I um, calculated that, I calculated it at 1.99 million and I see that you have it here as 1.728 million. Is, are the additional monies found somewhere else or did I just over calculate? Uh, well, that's the, I, I don't uh, know uh, for sure what was in your calculation, but we, you know, calculated it fresh based on uh, current salaries. That does not include the fringe benefits. That's my similar. question. So where is the, where are the fringe benefits? So um, similar to what we were just uh, saying on the 15 minutes, the one line item, um, can you see benefit costs? Under I do, yes. Okay. Additional salaries so, and positions and healthcare, OPEB and yeah. FICA. Yes, so uh, do you see to the right 9439064? That was how much benefits increased for the sum of all the initiatives. Okay, That's thank you for that. clarifying that. I just wanted to make sure. Sure. I have no further questions. Thank you for your work on this. Thank you. Thank you. 
<clears throat> Thank you, Ms. Mack. Next looks like we have uh, Ms. Jose. Um, Dr. Hager, if she's quick, can go before me um, and then I can go after her. OK, Dr. Hager. Yeah, it's really quick. And it's just a, a process question because I'm still learning. Um, so there is a footnote that says that placeholders for board mandated budget reductions, the line items will to be reduced are to be determined. Is that normally how the budget is written, that the, the reductions are not part of the board approval process, so that we, we don't know where the reductions are coming from? Um, well, that that would not be a typical situation. Um, I can't think of um, us uh, having been given that as an amendment in the last several years. So the board mandated that we needed to cut $3.5 million, but there was not enough time to identify where those dollars will come from. So we spread it throughout the budget um, and then Dr. Williams and staff will need to uh, determine where those reductions will actually come from. So that could happen in time for the county um, executives budget and we could work with the budget office there to reduce the dollars or if it was not identified until after next year started. Um, and depending on what the change was, it might require uh, a BAT that we've mentioned before, a budget appropriation transfer, but it was simply not having enough time to identify uh, reductions of that magnitude. We had to just put a placeholder in and spread it throughout the budget. So tonight we will approve this budget and then the, the reductions will happen at, at some point down the road. And assuming we never have another ransomware attack, then next year we can start the process earlier and so this doesn't happen next year. Is that usually what you would expect? Start um, the oh well you would get the full budget book earlier. The rest the rest of the process has pretty much stayed on time. Okay. Um, just the delay of two weeks or so of getting the full budget book is that was the net effect of the ransomware. OK, all right. Thank you very much. OK, uh, looks like uh, next is Mr. Mm -hmm. Jones. Yes, thank you, Ms. Scott, and I would like to thank Dr. Williams first of all and all of the staff um, that have worked so diligently and hard on this budget. Uh, thank you on behalf of the board. I am going to move that um, I move to adopt the superintendent's proposed FY 2022 operating budget as amended by the Board of Education. Okay, is there a second? Second, Rod McMillian. That is Rod McMillian. And thank you, Ms. Jost, for putting it in the chat. Ms. Jost made a motion to adopt the superintendent's proposed FY 2022 operating budget as amended by the Board of Education, and it was seconded by um, Mr. McMillian. And um, are there any questions on the motion to adopt the budget? It looks like there's a question from Ms. Causey. Yes, Ms. Causey. Madam Chair, I believe Ms. Jose uh, has the opportunity to speak to her motion. Ms. Jose, did you want to speak to your motion? No, it's pretty self-explanatory. We've been working on this for three years, you know, so the budget process. Um, I don't have anything to say. The motion is pretty self-explanatory. Thank you. Ms. Causey, did you have a question on the motion? Um, yes, I did. Um, at the prior work sessions, board had asked, board members had asked for uh, specification for funding opportunities, including the State Superintendent CARES Act announcement of $60 million, uh, the Kerwin um, legislation that passed, what opportunities are there, and um, other, <clears throat> excuse me, CARES funding that may come from the federal government. And I didn't see that um, in the weekly update. I'm sorry. Um, so I, I'm asking you, staff, is there information that would? I'm sorry, are you speaking to the motion um, uh, proposed? Uh, because that's what we're processing, the um, Ms. Joseph's motion. Yes, I yes, I would like to have this information before I decide to vote. So I didn't see it in the weekly update, and I'm um, asking a question of staff. 
OK, I'm not sure how that's related to the motion. Um, so you're asking about the weekly updates that you asked a question that you didn't get an answer to or. I'm just not seeing how that. Um, Miss Scott, I'm 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 happy to answer you, but I do not want this to take up my time. So I asked a question. Of staff. OK, OK, so uh, yes, no, and I don't want to I don't want to take up your time either. Um, I guess what I'm thinking is, is that maybe perhaps that question could be asked after we process the motion, perhaps. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure that everybody had the opportunity um, to speak to the motion or if they had a question. Um, Madam Chair, could I just I believe I did answer. Mrs. Causey's question last week, but um, I don't believe that we prepared a written response, so I will um, try to offer some clarification um, that the uh, the CARES Act, which is significant, it, and I believe Dr. Williams addressed this as well, is a uh, is limited funding for about just two and a quarter years, and so because most of these uh, programs uh, are not one time programs. Uh, we uh, have not uh, supplanted the budget proposal uh, at this time with any uh, possible grant funds. Uh, the the Kerwin uh, bill uh, has moved forward, uh, but I think as Mr. Tantliff mentioned last week, the the impact in the next two years is not significant, um, and we won't begin to see any uh, operating budget impacts uh, beyond some restricted programs like uh, concentration of poverty grants for several more years. Um, and the third item that we addressed was the governor's $1.5 billion uh, emergency COVID related funding. And um, those proposals were primarily social service oriented um, and did not include uh, education. The one uh, grant that the governor has proposed for FY 2022 is a $19.2 million tutoring grant um, for which we we don't have any uh, programmatic guidance yet from MSDE. Uh, and when we get that, uh, we'll be able to come back to the board um, with uh, a description of of how it affects programs and a budget amendment to appropriate it. Thank you. And just to be clear that the master agreements with our five bargaining units have not concluded. What is the timing for bringing those agreements to the board for approval? We would have to defer to HR and Ms. Lowry on that. Uh, and I'm not sure she has the appropriate staff, but uh, Ms. Larry, could you respond to that? Sure. <clears throat> Typically, um, when we are finalizing those, um, they can't be finalized until um, we have the the final from the the county as far as the budget is concerned. Because if there are <clears throat> compensation um, issues that are raised with regard to the master agreements. They have to be adjusted accordingly based upon what's um, determined at the county executive level um, with regard to the budget. So that would be um, typically the end of May when you would get those um, finalized master agreements. OK, and then the summer school funding has uh, has that been increased for this summer? We have talked about recovery for our students. 
um, and uh, exploring programs. I know there was a program last summer, um, so, and I don't believe that that's been addressed yet. So how is that reflected in the budget this year and or in uh, what could come from CARES funding? So Ms. Causey, I, I shared before, we're looking at um, providing that kind of support um, through the summer, which would um, be a part of the grant funds that Mr. Sayers referenced. Thank you. I'll finish and yield my time. Thanks. OK, and let's see. I want to make sure I get everybody in order. Um, I look like Ms. Rowe. Yes, so. I don't think it's a secret to anyone that for a very long time I've been dissatisfied with the entire budget process. And the more I learn about this budget process by going through it, the more I realize that the dissatisfaction has a lot to do with the idea that this board has more control over the budget and spending and how money is actually spent than we really do. And that has a lot to do with how the General Assembly has set up these 13 categories and how all of that works. And I had actually seriously considered abstaining from this budget simply because it almost seemed pointless. But since this board has managed to find a way to increase schoolhouse budget, that seems like a significant thing to me. So I'll be supporting the budget. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. OK, were there any other questions or comments? OK, if not, Ms. Gover, could we have a roll call vote, please? On the motion. Excuse me, Madam Chair. I'm sorry. Uh, is that Ms. Causey? Uh, yes. OK, yes. Go ahead, Ms. Causey. I was just reserving my time um, for any other board members that had comments before we make the vote. Um, and Ms. Rose comments are well taken. So my question is um, to the um, superintendent, when the board votes on the budget, the operating budget, we're voting on the exact specifications. We're not voting on just 13 categories. And is that uh, the superintendent's understanding and that if there are programmatic changes or as in policy organizational changes at certain levels, the board needs to be uh, presented with those recommendations and provided approval so that really the board is voting on the programs and on the specific funding and the specific um, personnel, as many motions were made to, not just on the 13 categories. So I just like to understand from the superintendent his perspective on that especially related to policy. Point of order, Ms. Scott, this has nothing to do with the motion on the floor. This is, seems like a, a lack of understanding of the budget process and it should be addressed separately. Um, this is Ms. Causey's, what, fifth or sixth budget on the board. Uh, so this is not a question that needs to be processed now, if it could wait. Okay, all right. Um, is it related to the motion? That's, I guess, what we're trying to process. So, um, Ms. Causey, um, is that a question that you perhaps could ask later? Because it sounds like it's an operational type of question. No, it's not operational. It's directly related to the motion and whether I'll vote for it. Because like Lily Rowe, having been on this board for five years and gone through the uh, budget cycle and also gone through the budget allocation transfers that happen at the end of the year, uh, millions of dollars okay. at times taken from special ed um, and <clears throat> okay. uh, different places. So, so it's done right, so after the fact when in fact the board, right. there's so policies that answer, relate to the board's Ms. governance Causey, and please. oversight of the operating budget. All right. So if staff, is there a question in there? Because we, we would like to process this motion. Um, so if staff could um, answer Ms. Causey's question so that she could better process the motion so that we can vote. We can move on. So I'll respond and then I'll ask um, Dr. Scriven or, or Mr. Sayers to respond. Um, last year's budget 
um, and the focus has always been on schools and providing the supports to schools. Uh, unfortunately, uh, we were at a maintenance of effort, which meant there had to be some extreme measures uh, made to be a maintenance of effort budget that we're currently in. And as Ms. Kalji shared, the policy, any organization change uh, based on policy will be presented to the board um, as outlined in the policy. So we will continue to focus on the needs of our students and needs of our schools if we have the appropriate funding. But Dr. Scriven, Mr. Sayers, any additional comments? No, Dr. Williams, we, we would yield um, and we are under the direction of your vision. Um, so there's there's nothing that we would add to that, sir. Thank you, Dr. Williams. I appreciate that. And I would also point out that in these budget cycles, um, you are my third superintendent. So um, it, your perspective is vital and your commitment to. OK, all right, looks like that is the timer. That just Excuse went me. off, so. Um, yeah. um, oh, I thought I you was replying talking. to Dr. Williams. Okay. And uh, I just appreciate that it is the collaboration and the 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 work between the superintendent and his team okay. um, and the board that will make any operating budget effective. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Calzy. OK, so um, with that, uh, Ms. Gover, if we could take a roll call vote, please, so that we could um, process the motion. Ms. Yes. Ms. Cosby? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Jeff? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kim? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Thank you. Okay, um, so it looks like the motion, uh, um, is, um, the motion carries. Madam Chair? Yes, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, I had a related motion, but had opted to um, allow the previous motion to process. Um, may I introduce it at this time? It's on the current agenda item. Okay, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Hager asked in her comments about starting the budget work earlier, and I agree that this effort needs a sustained commitment from the board and would like to make the following motion. I move to establish a standing board budget committee supported by the superintendent's designated staff to provide year round focus on allocating resources equitably for all students. Second, Causey. OK, and, and Ms. Hen, if you could please put that in the chat. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And that way I may properly restate the motion. OK. OK, so Ms. Hen made a motion. Um, Ms. Hen said I moved to establish a standing board budget committee supported by the superintendents designated staff to provide year-round focus on allocating resources equitably for all students. And it was seconded by Ms. Causey. Okay, um, Ms. Hen, would you like to speak to your motion? Thank you, Madam Chair. Only briefly, um, the board has discussed um, this motion previously, and I believe we've all seen, having gone through a number of budget cycles now, the amount of work that is involved and the amount of time and attention that um, a budget of this magnitude requires and the importance of such. So I affirm my previous stance that we need a dedicated group um, to focus on budget related issues and ask for your support of this motion at this time. Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Hen. It looks like there is a question from Ms. Jose. Yes, real quick, since this is not 
related to the budget, can the student member vote on this? Because Ms. Hen has brought this motion at least a couple of times to the board, and I believe because it is a procedural um, motion to establish a standing committee of the board, just like when I made the motion for the equity committee, I believe the student member voted on it. So the question is for Mr. Brissades, uh, does this require seven votes? Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. Hello, I'm sorry, I was distracted. Uh, the student <laughs> member, the student member can vote on this motion. Thank you, Mr. Mercedes. Thank you for that. And it looks like we also have a question from um, Mrs. Pastor. Oh, thank you. If somebody I could mute, I keep hearing music. <laughs> thank you, Ms. Scott. Uh, <laughs> The, I guess my question is to uh, Ms. Hen. We've we've had um, discussions about the standing committee, and my question is: um, in creating a standing committee, I certainly hear um, her concerns and and the amount that goes into putting this together, and it would be under the auspices of a staff person. But I still am unclear about how forming the budget committee, and I'm sure she has it in her head, um, is going to impact uh, what we do with our students, how we move the system forward. I just would like to hear some of that. What what kinds of plans are in in your mind, Ms. Hen, that Hen, um, in terms of what the role, what the duties and responsibilities would be, in fact, how they would be laid out for such a standing budget committee, just as was done for the equity that went back to policy and we could see the rollout curriculum, we can see the rollout, et cetera. Can you help me with that, please? Sure. Madam Chair, may I respond to Ms. Pester? Yes, please. Thank you. So, um, one primary goal of this committee and the my motion specifically states that it would be supported by the superintendent's designated staff is to facilitate um, a closer working relationship between the board and staff on the budget year round so that we can have questions answered um, about specific areas of concern by staff and to work with staff on our motions so that we don't have these marathon sessions and board members are left scrambling, trying to um, do what they feel is right and makes sense. So working together with staff, this really is intended to be a collaborative effort. And just as all of our committees um, function, they are collaborative efforts between the board and the staff that support us. And this is to, um, it, it will provide professional development, one for board members to better understand our budget because it is complex. We we work with it one time a year, not year round, and we have a lot of questions and we need greater comprehension and greater communication and to have these conversations. Um, this is to facilitate those conversations year round, and I hope hope that answers your questions. This is Pastor. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Hen. I agree that one year trying to do this every year, it gives me a headache, um, but and it makes for a lot of reading, which is important reading. I'm still not clear and I would just be far more comfortable, as you know, um, if I may be understood even when the budget committee was connected with the audit, but just understanding what the monthly work the ongoing work of that committee would be in tandem with staff. Maybe Mr. Williams or someone on staff could answer that for me. Sure. And may I respond to that briefly, Madam Chair? Oh, yes. Uh huh. So I found it, um, e even though this was an unusual year and um, the budget book took so much work from staff, which I, I truly appreciate. Um, chunking that out into sections was very helpful in managing um, the work, at least for me personally. So in terms of a monthly agenda, um, I can see this committee focusing on particular areas of the budget each month throughout the cycle and doing a deep dive 
into those areas. So business services, CNI, schools budgets, and really gaining a better understanding, a mastery of the budgets that we are entrusted to oversee and making this process by year end so much more easy, you know, easier because we've been through it. And board members, like any committees, would be welcome to participate. Um, so hopefully that helps. I, I envision a monthly agenda. Um, one way that that could be organized would be around sections of the budget to to focus in on those and to, you know, any other areas of focus that that board members would be concerned about and working closely with our equity committee because that's going to drive um, a lot of the conversations, I'm sure. Does that help Mrs. Pasture? It does. Do I have any time left on my two minutes? Because I just, I need to see it. It is very different from what we have. I hear what you're saying and you know that I embrace the whole notion of, of the budget and us having conversations beforehand. I just like to see it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Next looks like we have a question from Ms. Causey. <clears throat> Ms. Causey? Thank you. I, I thought I heard someone else speaking. Is it someone else's turn to speak? No, I called your name. You're next. Okay. Uh, it was Ms. Pastor and then you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I did just want to say um, there are a number of issues that um, from my opinion we did not really process as much as we um, should have in terms of the operating budget. We um, have talked a great deal about teachers um, and and the importance and staffing and all of the different offices, but we did not have any conversations about where are we in compensating our employees in terms of recruitment retention. Um, so those are the sorts of conversations that could be had in a budget committee. The other issue is input from our advisory councils. Um, also reviewing policies uh, to make sure that those are um, uh, being addressed and also if they need to be improved. Um, also, just like our other committees, um, board members would contribute their specific talents, interests, and expertise. Um, and just like our equity committee, which was founded um, without a prior notice, um, without a uh, guideline, but yet it has become a very, very um, important committee and it's driving a lot of mission critical work. So I would um, <clears throat> suggest to board members that this is something that is very important. Um, and even moving forward from this month with this operating budget, there's additional um, um, consideration that's gonna need to be done based on the county executive's funding based on additional um, bargaining unit issues. So the work on the budget continues and this is going to be um, a really organized way to process that. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for that, Ms. Causey. Were there any additional questions? I, I had a question, Ms. Scott. Oh, yes, Ms. Mack. Um, I just well, actually it's a comment. It's not a question. Um, I would just like to say that my approach to the budget budget this year was somewhat bifurcated um, based on the fact that we did receive information at different times. But where where I see the value of a budget committee is where I kind of ran, ran out of time and ran out of steam. When we look at each one of these um, line items, I think it would be helpful as the year rolls along to understand where we as a school system are compared to um, other school systems. And I know the Office of Internal Audit provided some of that data, but um, I had just begun to dig into some additional data. And I think if we as a committee are, or the committee would bring it back to the full board, we'd have a better understanding of where we are as far as to Ms. Um, Causey's point. Where are we? You know, we're 12 out of 24 LEAs for paying our teachers. Um, which puts us right in the middle. But then when you look at compression and where that puts us, that's a whole different game. When we look at our central office cost compared to other LEAs, um, it, there's some very big aha moments there. And I think if that was done um, over the course of 12 months instead of whatever, six weeks, um, I think it would be a better end product. 
Thank you. Thank you for that, Ms. Mack. And um, I just have a question um, for Ms. Hen. I, I just wasn't clear, um, and I think it may have, um, you may have stated it, but I just wanted to know if you could restate it, how this committee would be any different than the audit committee. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. So this committee's um, charter and focus would be entirely separate from the audit committee. Um, several members, Ms. Mack, Ms. Causey, address specific areas that it could address, um, allowing us to do a deeper dive into budget areas, areas of concern, working specifically um, with our fiscal staff in understanding this. So for instance, tonight we discussed the reallocations and how after the board had approved those amendments to the budget, staff would need to go back and find where to um, make those reallocations. Ideally, that would not be a task that they would have to do. That would be an ongoing conversation with the committee and with the entire board um, to talk about these priorities year round. Um, this is too large of a budget to focus on just at um, you know budget time. It's it's a conversation that we need to have on an ongoing basis. Um, it needs to be focused. It needs to be inclusive of all board members, and it's entirely separate from the the focus and mission of the audit committee. OK, thank you for that. It uh, looks like we have a question or comment from Ms. Rowe. Yes, I could see the benefit of this committee. If it does absolutely nothing else, it would do two things. It would allow board members to gain an understanding of the budget that cannot be gained in a short period of time. But more importantly than that, it would allow the public to gain an understanding of the budget. Because I don't think the public fully realizes that we pass a budget, but then how the money spent is however, however the school system wants to spend it within those 13 categories. And then at the end of the year, we are asked to approve BAT transfers for however money was underspent or overspent within those 13 categories. But that is how the General Assembly set it up. And so I think that where a huge part of the misunderstanding comes in is that this board and the public do not know how the money's moving around within each of the 13 categories different from how it was passed in the budget. So I think that a committee would go a long way towards taking the time to actually unpack those things so that people could understand the statutory authority of this board and how, what authority this board has and doesn't have and exactly how that fits in so that when the community is advocating for this, that, or the other thing, they know which public body they need to go advocate to. Okay. All right, thank you for that, <clears throat> Ms. Rowe. Next we have uh, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you, Ms. Scott. I'll try to be brief. Um, one question that I have, we've been talking about the operating budget um and that's what we just passed but there's also a capital budget is is your understanding miss hen that both the capital budget and the operating budget would be, would be reviewed and um and and better understood within the confines of the, the budget um, committee may i respond madam chair yes please yes um that's my short answer mr kuhn yes that would be within the purview as well Okay, great. And just to kind of, you know, share, you know, make a comment on this. These budgets take staff, you know, a tremendous amount of time and energy to make and uh, pull together. So we, <laughs> there, there are little, uh, this is one of the key things that we do as a board and understanding, you know, you put your priorities you spend your money on your priorities. So it's very important that we fully understand where where the money goes uh, as a board, as an organization. So I fully support this. I think it's a great idea. And I think we'll all learn a lot because it takes it takes a significant amount of time to to understand the process behind all of this and all of the spending that we do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. OK, are there any additional questions or are we ready um, to vote on Ms. Hen's motion? Um, Madam Chair, may I make one last comment briefly? Yes, 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I just wanted to clarify that um, the this motion is not intended to create a lot of additional work for staff. I'm very sensitive to that and this is not to um, create work, create deliverables for staff. We have plenty of work, you know, my vision for this committee is to work with what we've been given and that is plenty to, to get this committee going and to work from. So I, I am sensitive to um, limited resources and staff's time and I didn't want board members to um, misconstrue the motion in that yes, the committee would be supported like our other committees by superintendent staff, but more of a conversation rather than um, to be too resource intensive or um, heavy on requests in terms of staff time. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, and um, all right, and are we ready for the roll call vote, Ms. Scover? Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Can you please come back to me? Thank you. Yes, sir. Ms. Jeff? Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Mahomza? Mr. Offerman? No. Ms. Pester? I abstain. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Abstain. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Seven in favor. Favor is seven. Opposed is one. Abstention is two and two absent. Two absent. Okay, thank you. Um, so the looks like the motion passes. Okay, thank you for that. All right. Okay, and um, so we can um, move on now. And um, I think we've really got a lot done today. So I'm um, considering the lateness of the hour. I just would like to make a motion to move items J, K and L to the March 9th meeting. Is there a second? So moved. Or okay. Second, Mac. Third, Thank Q. You. <laughs> Thank you. All right, um, uh, Ms. Gilbert, may we do a roll call vote, please? Excuse me, Madam Chair. Ms. Well, can you just I'm, state for the record what those items are, the agenda items that we're moving? Oh, yes, in, in board docs, um, J, K, and L. So that's the committee updates. Um, and then uh, K is the um, uh, Southeast Area Education Advisory Council Student Count 2020 Report Update on Key School Legislation, and then consideration of agenda items for future board meetings. So if you have if you have your board docs up, you'll be able to see it under J, K, and L. Yep. So um, so we're we not going to have thinking. agenda setting requests. No, I had to move to the next meeting. So okay. it's been, yep, moved and seconded. So now we are taking a roll call vote because it is 1116 at night. So uh, Ms. Gover, if you can take the roll call, please. Ms. Rowe? Yes. Ms. Causey? No. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McMillian? Yes. Ms. Joe? Ms. Han? Yes. Mr. Mohamza? Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Ms. Scott? Yes. Okay, so it looks like it passes. Thank you. Thank you. So Madam we'll Chair, I have a motion, Ms. Causey. Well, the, we voted for the meeting to basically come to an end. So you want to make a motion now? Yes. 
OK, um, let me ask legal counsel. Is it appropriate since we voted to basically move the items and go to the end um, for members to make motions? We have not adjourned, so. OK, that's why I thought it would be appropriate. OK, I just would like order. to. Order. Madam, legal chair, on, Madam Chair, on what agenda item is Ms. Causey's motion per pertaining? I'm not <laughs> sure. That's why I'm trying to get legal counsel. The op, it was, uh, it was the, um, related to the budget committee. So re related to the budget. Okay. Um, I thought we were in Ms. announcements now. Yeah, we're in announcements now. Yeah, we're no longer there. Okay, yeah. so I have. So we, have I, I, at the, so we can do it at the, um, I, you can do it at the next meeting because now we're, uh, we're in announcements and we're, so I, we need to, I need to go ahead on to that. I'm sorry, Madam Chair. I put things in the chat um, and then I wait to be acknowledged, but then things happen before I get acknowledged. So I so I, I, I'd I, like the opportunity I, to say Ms. what my motion uh, is Kelsey, and then Ms. Mr. Mercedes, you, are you there? Mr. Mercedes Has can say whether it's us? appropriate. Mr. Mercedes, are you there? Yes, I am here. And okay. if it's a budget related motion, then the time for that has passed. Thank you. So now we're in announcements and the last item on the agenda is announcements. And so the announcement is that the board's next meeting will be held virtually on Tuesday, March 9th, 2021 at 6.30 p.m. So I thank you for joining us tonight and the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. Hope everyone has a good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you.